Captain Bill Toady, and this week's episode, I'm coming to you from the historic Royal Hawaiian Hotel. This week, we're bringing you Captain Toady's Pearl Harbor. No visit to Pearl Harbor is complete without a visit to the Pacific Submarine Force Museum at the historic sites of Pearl Harbor, where the USS Bowfin is housed. So he visit with Chuck Merkel, who's been featured on one of our other podcasts, and we're gonna to tour the USS Bowfin in a way that you would not be able to do otherwise, and the Pacific Submarine Force Museum. Unfortunately, at this point in the podcast recording, I suffered a rookie mistake when the battery on my lapel microphone died. So you're going to have difficulty hearing me. It's picked up a bit on Chuck's microphone. Good news is the important information is provided by Chuck and his microphone worked fine. So I apologize for that, but let's press on. We're with Chuck Merkel here today. He is the uh, executive direct director executive director of both the USS Bowfin Museum and the uh, Pacific Submarine Force Museum. Is yep. that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you'll remember, Chuck, from our episode on the Submarine Medal of Honor recipients from World War II, where we went through a bunch yeah. of those. That was a great time, Chuck. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I enjoyed it too, Bill. Yeah, and Chuck was here in Hawaii, and I was in Florida when we reported that. Seth was in you know, Mississippi. Um, yeah. But now I'm in Pearl Harbor, and we are standing in front of the Bowfin. Now, give us some background on the Bowfin, Chuck. Okay, sure. So, uh, Bowfin was the third ship in the Baleo class, which had the had the deeper depth capability of 400 feet from 300 feet. She was launched at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on December 7th, 1942, and she was named Pearl for Harbor Day, right? yeah Pearl Harbor. That one year after the attack. Okay. And she was named for a freshwater fish that's native to the Mississippi drainage in North America that's uh, notably very aggressive nighttime shallow water predator. So pretty appropriate name for a submarine. And she commissioned on 1st of May, 1943, so she's just over 80 years old right now. And during the course of nine war patrols here in the Pacific, she lived up to her namesake and her nickname. She claimed 44 vessels sunk, um, in the final accounting, she ranks in the mid-teens in both number of ships and amount of tonnage sunk during the war. And what was that nickname? Uh, the Pearl Harbor Avenger. Okay. Yeah. Because she was launched on December 7th or commissioned on December 7th? Uh, launched. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, she did her part in yeah. avenging Pearl Harbor. Certainly did. Yeah. Great. So we're going to go inside and take a look around like uh, nobody else can. Right, Chuck, this right. is obviously a working museum. So yes. We're going to have people going by, but that's that's great because yeah. it means uh, people are learning, right? That's fact. Yeah. All so right. We're up on the forward main deck of, of Bowfin, and I don't know if you could pan the camera down. We're a long way above the top of the pressure hole. Mm -hmm. The pressure hole itself is 16 feet in diameter. And all of this area was free flood. And you really had to think of Bowfin as a small surface ship that could submerge for brief periods. It's true for all the World War II, all yeah. diesel submarines right. even today. Right. That's fact. So uh, immediately behind us here, if you want to pan, uh, during her modifications, mid middle of the war, this high-frequency sonar system was added onto the ship. So there's a one piece of it on this side, and the other side was the the other piece. So that was used for mine detection. And on Bowfin's ninth war patrol, she went into the Sea of Japan with eight other submarines. Mm -hmm. It was the first time we'd been in the Sea of Japan since the loss of the Wahoo in October of '43. Right. And uh, it had been Admiral Lockwood's goal to get back in the Sea of Japan. And really, by the end of '44, there weren't very many targets worthy of torpedoes anymore. Yeah, and the we, Sea of Japan was about the last bastion that they had. Yeah, there's some in the Formosa Strait, Taiwan Strait, right. Right, where Rokane and Barb um, were lost. Right. Rokane wasn't lost, but the Barb was. The Sea of Japan, slim pickings. Yes, so they... they Admiral Lockwood's goal was to train and certify these nine ships. We know all nine of them made it into the Sea of Japan. They dispersed around the Sea of Japan, and on a set date, they started executing their attacks. They then rendezvoused at the northern end of the Sea of Japan and uh, came back here to Pearl Harbor on the 4th of July, 1945. Nine made it out. Eight. Only eight made it out. Only eight. And the then bonefish. Then La Perouse, La Perouse. Which is where uh, Wahoo was lost. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. 
and uh, they bonefish know didn't make bonefish it. was lost in that patrol on her way out but the other eight came back was it mines for bonefish I i'm not sure that they've ever figured out what it okay. was All right i don't that's another one of those mysteries so yep now the the deck guns uh, talk to us about that so initially bofin had a four inch gun it was back here on where this round plate is the mount's still there but during her uh major maintenance period i'll call it here on the west coast of the united states this gun was removed and a five inch gun was added to the stern mm -hmm. this gun really didn't have that much punch and so with a five inch gun and bofin carried out quite a few surfaced attacks with that gun that's probably one of the main reasons she didn't get a lot of credit for some of the vessels she sank because they were too small to be evaluated and, and credited yeah in the post-war evaluation where we tallied um and balance the scorecard. Yeah, those right. uh, small boats, which were critical to the war effort because they carried a lot of supplies. You know, a lot of the boats didn't get credit for those kills. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So you want to go inside? Let's head down. So this stairway obviously wasn't here when Bofin was in commission, but this was how weapons were shipped down into the forward torpedo room, set on the deck, tilted up to match the angle, and then down into the room they came. Mm -hmm. it's from the conning tower, so unlike what you see on movies, right. fire one, fire two, one fired electrically. Right. But the torpedo men were also back here, right. firing them manually in case if needed they, to. Yeah. See those red, the red button, plunger button on each tube. Right here was how that would be launched. Yeah, here, so it's deep. So as they're pushing the plunger in the conning tower, they're ready to shoot. Down here as ready well. to go. Yep. Pushing it now to, to manually fire in case. The electric firing this mechanism doesn't right. work. So, yeah. yep. so here in the forward torpedo room, there's six torpedo tubes, all arranged three to a side of the bow vertically. Could carry a total of 16 weapons here in the room, six preloaded in the tubes, and then another 10 reloads in the stows. Mm -hmm. There's actually three reloads down beneath the, the deck we're standing on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no hydraulics to operate any of these right. systems, so everything was uh, manpower. Block and tackle. Block and tackle. Um, yeah, we nice we'd still figured out the interlock system, so the, there's interlocks to keep the inner and outer door from being open at the <laughs> same time. Which would be bad. That would be a really bad day. But I always like to point out these tubes are 21 inches in diameter, and this is exactly the same as all of our modern ships, except the Seawolf class. Right. So our modern weapons are basically the same size as uh, our World War II this weapons. Mark 14s were, yeah. Right. And, um, you know, in the torpedo room, the torpedo men would also set depth. Right. They'd run depth. Right. And But they, they couldn't, in real time, as they're loading, decide whether it was going to be impact or influence, the magnetic right. explosion that right. had to be set. Before, before loading, yeah. Before loading, right. Right, so when the weapon got lined in the tube and, and the guide stud locked mm -hmm. with the stop bolt, they're actually mechanical shafts, so a lot of these gearing that you see that goes into the tube, three shafts actually connected to the torpedo. Mm -hmm. One was to set the speed high or low. You kind of, high was pretty much the default. Yeah. The depth was running depth. And then the final shaft was the gyro course. Yeah. And that, st that shaft remained engaged and the gyro course was continuously updated until standby was selected. And then when standby was selected for that tube, that shaft withdrew and that was the final firing interlock to enable the tube to fire. Yeah. And you see the shiny piping here behind Bill that's the impulse flask for the six torpedo tubes are actually up outside the superstructure, outside the pressure hole in the superstructure. And when the fire signal was given, the stop bolt rolled, and then air was pushed into the tube, and that's what ejected the weapon out. Yeah. Modern torpedoes, we use water, and we push and we have a ram that pushes impulse water so it shoots out with water, not air, which makes it less detective. Right. But back then, it was 100% air. They'd need to recharge those air flasks. Right. Which meant that it's something that they would do once they surfaced, because you can't recharge. Well, they had, they had high-pressure air flasks, so they right. could recharge from there. But, you know, that was their, at the end of the day, when they had to surface. Yeah. I mean, their goal 
at the end of the before the sun came up in the morning was batteries fully charged, air banks topped off, made as much fresh water as you can. Final thing they would do was throw their trash overboard in weighted bags, and then they would do a trim dive to make sure they were ready for the day. So that, that air bubble, you didn't want that air bubble to come out. It would be like a big burp coming out of the water. Or you're only a half a mile away from your target. Good chance of being seen. So there's actually a relief valve on each tube that was designed to vent that air back into the chip. Mm-hmm. Once that valve opened, it had to be manually shut. So among the many other things that was going on in here is the torpedo men had to watch for when water started to issue out of that pipe. It was time to shut that valve, and then that enabled them to shut the outer door, drain the tube, and then be ready to reload and go again. Fantastic. Now, we talked about in, uh, let's see, was it the Gene Fucky episode? Yeah, it was Gene Fucky and the bar. Um, where he, where the torpedo men were begging him to shoot some torpedoes so that, in the after torpedo room, so that they would have a place to sleep. Right. These are real world issues. Right. That's right. Real world constraints, and he did indeed shoot some after torpedoes to get right. more Berlin space. Right. Yeah. And I do think too that I think that they didn't have much of a record. They hadn't until he took over. The barb had not been a very success. Had not had many successes, if any. And the aft torpedo room had never felt like they'd ever contributed, so they really wanted to make that shot from an aft tube. To, Absolutely. To, that's a big morale booster. I can't tell you how much that is to, okay. to do that sort of thing. So. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Let's see what we can help. What else we can see in the show? All right. Sounds good. I mean, as you well know, Bill, there's a multiple purposes for every space in the in the room and the torpedo room is no exception the forward escape trunks located here in this torpedo room the officer's head or shower and shower in the back corner and uh, the main that passive sonar system is actually shifted down here during the modification because the fm sonar was put in its place in the conning tower no, All right. So here is, a, I kind of already mentioned the uh, officer's bathroom and shower was back here in the corner. I'm sure you were. And uh, this officer's hit. Right, that's fact. They didn't have his own. And these two shiny shafts was how the hydrophones from the main sonar system were lowered down below the ship when the ship was submerged. And then... With this switch, they could rotate the head around, but it's equivalent of putting a cone around your ear and listening. Yeah. yeah. And when you equate that to our modern ships, the ships Bill and I served on, mm-hmm. 1,200 hydrophones on a 16-foot diameter sphere at the front end of the ship. Oh, no, and this was all sense. oral processing. You had to be listening in that direction to capture that sound. So the next compartment is technically called the forward battery compartment because uh, one of the two main batteries is under the deck. So on both end, there were 120 cells in each of two battery compartments. Later ships had 126, and that's what you and I had on our on our boat, so 126 cells in one battery, that's right. And we'll step into the wardroom, Mm -hmm. and just forward of the wardroom is the pantry. Mm -hmm. And on submarines, still true today, everybody eats the same food. Mm -hmm. So the food came from the galley, was kept warm up here in the the pantry, and served. Mm -hmm. And it was important that the coffee was always warm, and... and, uh, so this is where the officers ate their meals, talked about the day, relived the attacks, mm-hmm. uh, played cribbage and other pastimes, but there probably wasn't a whole lot of relaxing when they were in uh, no. on a war patrol. No, no, but cribbage was a spectacular, still is, on mm-hmm. submarines. Yep. Past time, I was never a good cribbage player, yeah. and uh, so the captain would always want to play me because right. he figured he was going to win. Yep. Later, when I was captain, I just didn't play at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now we had still had stewards on submarines, yes. right? Yes. So, so yeah, yeah, we just released a book about the USS Indianapolis stewards called mm-hmm. "Heroes in the Shadows," mm-hmm. and but, but it's important to note. There was a, there were a couple of cooks to cook for right. everybody, including the officers. Right. But there was also one, probably a couple stewards that were assigned in here, you know, and 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 so I I don't you know can't candy coat it. It was the way it was. Yeah. You know, um, Filipino but, or African American. Right. Yeah. They were segregationed. Mm-hmm. Um, I know uh, O'Kane 
talked very fondly about his his uh, steward. Mm-hmm. Always had a cup of coffee. I guess he was quite the poker player. He was the last one on board when they were leaving any port somewhere, carrying all the crew's money, winnings. Yeah, it must have been quite a character. Uh, he uh, unfortunately was he. I from what I've read in books, he attempted an escape but didn't survive. Right. He, he, um embolized or something yep, on the right, way up and right. was dead by the time he got to the surface. And, yep. and again, same with the Indianapolis stewards. None of, none of the certain cooks yep. survived the same yep. time. Yep. So, um, yeah, this is an incredible place. Now, the radio that's up there, was that a, a short wave? Yeah, so that yeah. was, yeah, short wave radio. So at night they could tune in and listen to Tokyo, Tokyo Rose, Rose or <laughs> whoever else might have been broadcasting. Yeah. All the charts were kept in here in these lockers. Mm-hmm. I don't think... Too many people on board the ship knew where the submarine was going until they had left <laughs> Midway. When they let, got underway from Midway, they finally were, were able to say where they were headed. Yeah. One of our viewers, Chuck, asked a question about why they blamed Admiral King for this. We kept a squadron of submarines operating out of Australia. It was uh, in the Perth, Australia, area where there's still the submarine was today, mm-hmm. rather than moving all the submarines to, to Pearl Harbor. Well, and, and you know, the, the, it's like it's 1.5 times as far from Pearl Harbor to the operating areas as it is right. from, from Australia. And but, but beyond there, were there other issues? You know, I don't. I think you know the what wound up in Australia was the remnants of Seventh Fleet of what was in the Philippines, and then you know, right. the slow retreat down Cavite in the Philippines. Right. So yeah, when they when they abandoned the Philippines and down to Jakarta and then eventually, you know, the Houston and the, which Adelaide, I think, whatever the, Adelaide. yeah, the, the Australian cruiser that drove right into the uh, Japanese invasion fleet at Sunda Strait. Mm-hmm. I think it was a commitment to Australia mm-hmm. that uh, we had that facility down there. We didn't have all our eggs in one basket. At that point, Midway wasn't secure, so right. we couldn't really rely on Midway as a, as a refit base. Yeah. Probably, and, I, yeah. and I pointed out that even Lockwood had been the admiral in Australia, right? Submarine fleet. When he became sub pack after English died, he didn't move those submarines from Australia to Pearl Harbor. Right. Even though he was in Pearl Harbor, he kept them there. Right. And today we're we're learning the strategic value of yeah. Australia vis-a-vis Absolutely. China. Right? right. So right. it's it's not. I mean, it's an issue that's. Um, I think fairly well resolved the yeah. value of that strategic yeah. location. Right. Now, I know I've given you a tour before, and I don't remember whether it's before or after I figured out what this was, but look up over your head. You see all those bolts? Yeah. Oh, big boy, where is it? You see yeah, those, yeah, see all those yeah. bolts in that plate? That's the pressure hole. Really? So that's a yeah. bolted plate in the pressure hole, and it's immediately above the battery access hatch. <laughs> So every year they had to replace their batteries. I mean, these batteries were either charging or discharging. It wasn't like our, it wasn't like our nuclear submarine where we trickle discharge and then charge once a week. Yeah, those batteries they were either charging or char- discharging. So over a year they were in pretty bad shape. So to expedite the replacement, they could pull that plug, and there's one over the, there's one over the aft battery well as well. We'll see that in the cruise berthing. And I've actually found a third bolted plate. It's aft of the conning tower. I'm not sure what it was for yet. I haven't really? figured that out yet. But there were actually three bolted plates like that. They could pull one cell at a time, I see. Right. Oh, Just like how we did, 1,500 pounds a piece. 1,500 pounds a piece. Yeah. It's a major effort to replace a battery. It takes yeah. a long time. Yeah. I've done it twice in my career. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, now, now they don't even have a battery charging lineup anymore with the new batteries that we have in I place. I didn't know that. Of course, that's Virginia class. I know. And even on 688s like and Tridents are all backfitted with this new style. Basically, nobody could afford to produce these batteries anymore, so they made a transition. Okay. Right now we're so happy to have Chuck leading this tour because this is not an area that's known, that the general public is uh, permitted in, Chuck. And right. so we are in the conning tower of the bowfin. Now, I've separately filmed the inside of the conning tower of the Parchy. Okay. And so, you know, but this is, you know, that's been removed from the actual submarine. This is still 
in the submarine. Right. Chuck, what can you tell us about the conning tower? So the conning tower is a separate eight-foot diameter pressure hole that was located immediately above the control room. So there's a hatch that has access down into the control room, and then there's an access hatch up to the bridge above us. Mm -hmm. All the equipment to fight the ship is up in this compartment. There's an auxiliary home station. So during battle stations, the helmsman would be up here at this station. And this is actually a mechanical linkage that connects to the main helm. The shafts go outside the pressure hole and articulate down. So the amount of the number of pressure hole openings and penetrations on this ship would make a modern submariner very, very, nervous, very nervous. Because yeah. there's packing and that. And so there's stuffing tubes, stuffing and, tubes and, yeah. and, yep, and all those crazy things. So everything for the helm. So he was immediately available to the captain if the captain was up here in the conning tower during a submerged approach or if he was on the bridge for a surfaced approach. Now, we didn't have color CRTs back in those days. So uh, rig no. for red rather than rigging for gray. Correct. Same when we were junior officers. That's if right. If only CRTs were green screen, right. we would rig for red. Right. And all of these um, indicators here are configured to be visible right. when it's rigged for red right. for night surface attack. Right. And during a submerged attack, of course, you could be rigged for white. Right. Okay. Right. Or if it was dark, you'd want to have everything down and it turned off or red anyway. So mm -hmm. so I mentioned earlier the, the passive sonar system used to sit here. and In fact, in the Parchi conning tower, it still does because the Parchi never had this modification installed. Mm -hmm. But this was the high-frequency FM sonar that was used for the minefield mm -hmm. avoidance and penetration. Did it work? It worked. They got through. We had some some testimony from some bowfin sailors before they passed that they heard cables go down the side of the hull. But we know all nine of those submarines made it into that Sea wow. of Japan. Incredible. Yeah, pretty amazing. Good. And, and this is basically as sophisticated as radar was in those days. Right. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah, it's a little CRT, so this is a PPI display? Yes, yeah, and at the beginning of the war, all you got was a range. You didn't get a bearing. Right. It was like a, it was like a little blip. It would be a whole ring, or you would get an A-lit sort of it's thing, like our A-scan, right. A like our old narrowband system so back, in the, back in the day, the same sort of thing. Right. These were the firing panels up here, so the forward one here with the six sets of buttons was for the forward room mm -hmm. and then the back one was for the aft room mm -hmm. so this would be lined up whichever was next to fire and as the lights turned red and everything was ready to go these plungers this was the solenoid that actually fired the tube so you would go to standby on right. the switch right and then that lined it up that lined it up so yeah. there would only be one at a time right on standby right, right. And then so whatever you that is on standby, then you hit punch. The and, and when you go to standby, of course, the torpedo course rod is right. disengaged right. to allow the that torpedo engaged. to engage. That's right. Okay. And very cool. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that we kind of fed ourselves on in the old days. Um, yeah, we still, at least when I was a submariner, called the, the thing that caused the bearing to be transmitted from the periscope into the fire control system, we didn't call it TDC, the pickle. That's it. And this is why it was called the pickle, folks, because <laughs> this is what you would squeeze to get the bearing from the periscope into the torpedo data computer, which is right there. Right. And so I, I described this as an analog computer because right. I wanted to the most just, uh, um, you know, make folks understand that computers did not start in the digital age. We actually right. had analog computers in the day. Right. So there were two pieces to the, the torpedo data computer. The aft piece was the position keeper, and that was where the solution of the contact that we're going to attack was dialed in. Mm -hmm. And then the forward end was the angle solver. So it would solve for the gyro angle for either the aft torpedo tube attack or forward torpedo tube attack. And you got a list, a light when with things were within limits, and that would allow you to execute the attack. And within limits means the the uh, intercept point is within the constraints of the gyro angle limits right. on the torpedo. Correct. The torpedo can't turn more than a certain amount of degrees. Right. Okay. And I think you know most of the guy, most of the really successful guys were the ones that learned to point their tube where they wanted their torpedo to go, minimize the gyro angle because that turn introduces a advance and transfer, and and that was difficult to calculate and 
you were better off taking all of that out. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about it, more than about a degree of error in your solution mm -hmm. meant you were going to miss. That's exactly right. Yep. So it's pretty amazing that they could even hit it all when you, when you really think about what they had to go through. Now, mm -hmm. Bill and I, we both grow up with Mark 19 plotters in our submarines. <laughs> and this was an even earlier version of a Mark 19 plotter. Mm -hmm. So this device was electromechanical device. It took input for our own ship's course and speed, and then it drove a little position bug. And every minute, the plotter on his station in here would mark the bug. Um, nowadays, of course, this is all CRT driven. We don't have to do any of that stuff. But this is basically an electronic dead reckoning right, device. Right, correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. And so, um, yeah, again, I, I think I made this point in one of our earlier episodes that when we were both junior officers, we had the Mark 113, Mod 10 fire control system, mm -hmm. which was very similar to what you're seeing here. That's right. Hand cranks. That's right. There were analog computers with hand cranks where we'd dial in the, you know, our projected course right. speed yep. of the target. That's right. And range, and then the computer would, the analog computer would calculate torpedo right. parameters. That's right. To the intercept point. Yeah. yeah. So this, that was the early 80s, folks. So that's, that's this, right. from the 40s to 80s, 40 years, we hadn't progressed very much. No, nope, that's a fact. All right. Great. Thank you. Great. And okay. immediately across from the captain's stateroom is the department head stateroom. So there was a desk. You know, also note there were no doors on any of these staterooms. There was a rod here for <laughs> curtains. No, no curtains. doors in here. So that's the department head stateroom. Yeah, four department heads were right across from the captain. So Engineer, just, torpedo officer, and navigator. He could reach across the passageway and snap his finger. Right. And a five berthing space. This is for the chief petty officers. Mm -hmm. And of course, this obviously would have been a stainless steel cover, but every locker on a submarine has keys. Mm -hmm. They needed to make sure that. They put a spare part in a certain place that it would uh, accessible to everybody. Knew where it was, and and the yeoman shack and typewriter. Did, yep, and of course the radioman also had their typewriter. Uh -huh. All right. In the next compartment here is the control room. Mm -hmm. So this is the main helm station. Mm -hmm. so, so the most junior, one of the first qualifications for the junior sailors was uh, helmsman. Qualify helm, mm -hmm. and the helmsman he steered the ship based on the orders from the captain across the deck. But you can't see where he's going. So he uses his gyro mm -hmm. to maintain the course and he controls the rudder. There was a Angular indication for rudder indication, and this was the backup. These lights would light, depending on the position of the rudder. Rudder angle indicator. Definitely um, engine hurt telegraph. So two shafts, so two engine hurt telegraphs. When the captain or officer deck would order a speed change, that helmsman would position these pointers to the new order. That would ring a bell in the new ring area, and uh, electricians would position their pointer to indicate that bell was answered and being executed. Of course, they didn't worry about cavitations. There was no all ahead flank cavitate. All flanking was always cavitated. That's right. This was the main enlisted, senior enlisted watch station during the war to map, monitor the Christmas tree board. So these lights were red and green to indicate red meant open or danger, and green meant safe or shut. Mm -hmm. And it was this man's responsibility to continuously monitor the readiness to die. Mm -hmm. During daylight hours, and at the feeling of threat, an emergent dive would be ordered, and the vents were open without everything right. turning green. Mm -hmm. And you just relied on everybody's training to, to rig okay. and get everything yeah. shut. Uh, and a modern celebrity generally takes 10 minutes or so? Yeah, depending on, yep. Right, yeah. And these, these guys would have to do it in 45 That's seconds. The goal was to be completely underwater in less than a minute. Right. So they practiced with each watch team, so they were ready to do that. And there's no doubt we probably lost the submarine or two to an accident like that, because we don't know what happened to all 52 of those submarines. Right. We know we left men topside, men were left and swept into the sea and lost that way. So. 
Okay, the induction valve, which is the intake for the diesels, is a huge opening hole. If yeah. you don't get that shut before That's right. it goes underwater, there's a lot of water coming into the submarine. You kind of, you'll see these valves have different shaped handles. So that was so in darkness, the men could know which one they were operating. And uh, the bow and stern planes were operated from these two wheels. Mm -hmm. On that emergent dive, the lookouts who were up on the bridge were the first two men down from the bridge, and they manned the bow planes and the stern planes. So if you look out below, they'd be yeah, they'd jump they'd down to the conning tower, and they jump to the conning tower. Right, they had basically been in the run. They had like 25 feet vertical from their stations up on, on the bridge. Mm -hmm. Come down and man. The junior off the deck who'd been in the conning tower supervising the radar and the plot, he would come down and be the diving officer. So he backed up the man chief over here, chief of the watch, what we call him. We helped him get things straightened out here, and then he'd make sure he'd want to get the ship under, but then he wanted to be in control underwater as well. And the critical tank in that hall was a negative tank. So this tank was kept full on the surface, mm -hmm. as well as the safety tank was kept full on the surface. And when they did their trim dive before sunrise, they would mark this tank with a grease pencil mark where they had been neutrally buoyant on that. So they blow negatives yeah, right, to the neutral so point. He would come down, make sure the ship's getting underwater, making sure we're getting our everything rigged appropriately, mm -hmm. and then assess, get the ship completely underwater, and then he would blow that tank to that mark. If that didn't arrest the descent, he could continue to blow that tank. He had the safety tank then as a backup. Once that was empty, all you had was blowing the ballast tanks, which of course didn't want to do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The down and underneath this yellow compartment is the pump room. Mm -hmm. So air compressors, hydraulic plant, air conditioning, refrigeration, all auxiliary equipment down in that space. So those machinist meets then as well? Uh, yes. 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 Right. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we're now you. in the galley cruise mess. So a meal every six hours cranked out of this little small kitchen. Is there a cook and a baker? Or how yeah, there was a night baker generally, so yeah, so they cook. But there would be a meal every six hours. Basically, uh, when the meal was ready, the oncoming watch team would come in and eat and then relieve the watch, and then the outgoing men would come down and eat. Were they generally in three section? Yeah, three yeah. section, rather than port and starboard. Yeah. And I think most of them learned to sleep during the day. Yeah. Yeah. When they were going to be busy and active at night. The science of watch section is interesting. Yes, yeah. so, I think some of our British friends are still in Port and Starboard today, right? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's <laughs> correct. I mean, and now we're standing eight hour watches. Yeah, they do that or not. Three eight hour watch sections. 24 hours have been pulled this. Okay. But I think our day, you're three six hour watch sections, so right? And that which makes an 18 hour day, right? Which meant our body clock never adjusted. Our body clock was always screwed up. A circadian rhythm doesn't work when our bodies and our watches on the 18-hour schedule. It took a lot of scientific studies to finally convince. Yeah, it's really perfect. Well, it's in the so, yeah, so, yeah. The mess deck seating for 24, which was basically about a third of the crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this locker down into this space was the armory. So all the small arms were stored down here, okay. and the five-inch shells were stored here, down in this locker. And there we do pound stuff through that hatch. So this scuttle right here was right. what the pass-through was, how the shells would be sent up. Mm -hmm. So we get topside on the main deck, we'll see the other end of that. Mm -hmm. But the detonators and some ready shells were kept in the locker up on the main deck, right? Mm -hmm. The rest of the shells without their detonators were down here, they'd be passed. They still have to load the detonators before they load them to the gun. Right, that's right. Yeah, they got some that's ready nice. shells. Yeah, yeah. And then they, they get everything else ready. That'd take a lot of time. Yeah. Wow. Well, here we go. Uh, no Benny Great Wolf. What's on that? Yeah. Well, there's some others. There's some others throughout yeah. the house. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And of course, cribbage board. There was a cribbage board. Yeah, they say this wasn't just the officers who played cribbage, it's the officers too. Yeah. These are throughout the ship now. We've been in such a long day. We're driving on the ship now. So, all the pictures from the dock and board patrol. And this was actually a day that I saw. We had a big, big bit of wrench, a big hammer, a plunger, a big screwdriver, and toilet paper. Those were the guys that came down and they were on the ship. They had nothing else to respect. It was like a critical job. <laughs> yeah. 
This great area, they carry 60 days of provisions, and there'd be food everywhere. As you, know, you and I think did the same, you know, we would walk on food for 90 days. That's right. Okay, the next compartment we'll head into is the birthing area for the crew, and underneath here is the other battery with the 120 cells on both ends. Mm -hmm. Underneath here, here's the other opening at the top. To change out those battery cells. Right. And uh, we've also had some number of things in our collection that we and we found some things in the bones we were getting ready to go into dry dock last fall. So our curator put this display together. I think it's pretty pretty neat. It is. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Very cool. Let's see this one. So, what, do we know who the crewman was in the morning call? Uh, yes, I, I don't recall his name off the top of his head, but his name's actually in the. <clears throat> this guy, Pappy Carby, that's that's not a beard you can grow in one patrol. No, that's a serious beard. Yeah, he was. He did all nine more patrols on the boat. He was a motor machinist mate. So. Really. In addition to his beard, he was probably deaf. Submersible sound. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Chris, a, yeah. On the inside of the cuffs, we had what were called uh, liberty um, patches. So you'd roll up your cuffs and you could display, it's not regulation, but you would do that. Roll up your cuffs and you can display whatever port, liberty port, you got your patch from, and that shows how salty you are. That's right. Yeah. You know, sandals, shorts, and t-shirts were the uniform underway so that you didn't get heat rash and all those things, right? right. They got, you, we're all feeling it. Mm -hmm. So this picture is taken out from all sides, Pearl Harbor. Sierra 6, I believe. Which doesn't exist anymore. It right. didn't exist even when you and I were doing yeah. But uh, you can see there's a destroyer, destroyer escort on the other side of the pier. Well, mm -hmm. flying all of her pennants for claimed attack. She's flying her battle flag from the aft periscope. And in the World War II gallery, there's a picture of the crew mustered on top of both end. We'll take a look at that when we go into the museum. Right. But she's also flying her homeward bound pennant. Mm -hmm. And by tradition, that's a foot long for every sailor on board. That pennant's then cut into 12 inch pieces and given to each crew member. And here's three pieces of that pennant that we wow. have in our collection. Fantastic. Pretty amazing screen. Pretty amazing uh, thing. <laughs> you can see it you know, kind of flash into some of these bunks. Some of these were more preferred than others. It would, would only wake up and snap to alert once in here. That's right. <laughs> you hit your head. But you can certainly see that there were some bunks that were much better than others. Mm -hmm. This was a main passageway, so it's really why the torpedo rooms were more preferred birthing areas. Mm -hmm. Excuse us. Go through this space is the obstacle. Yeah, actually, it's, you know, I'm noticing here, Chuck, that when I was in Ensign, there's more space in this guy's overhead, this bunk oh, yeah, I had yeah. when I was on my first boat. Yep. And so, this doesn't suck in the submarine stand. Even this one's favorable. Yeah, probably good. Cruise head and showers in here. Mm -hmm. And the washing machine was in here, but it was very rarely used. Right. This is probably the one. Main engine rooms. Bofin had four main engines. Each engine was 1,600 horsepower. And our, our fleet submarines were considered diesel electric submarines. So the diesel generators ran and they turned DC generators that produced the power to charge the batteries. And then there were four electric motors that turned the two propeller shafts. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why she was called a diesel electric submarine. At the forward end of this engine room are the two stills, electric stills. They used electric energy to heat salt water to about 170 degrees. There was a partial vacuum drawn on that water so that it flashed to steam. And then the condensate was recondensed as fresh water. And all, all the nuclear submarines that Bill and I served on used that same device as a backup means of making fresh water. I mean, yeah, the evaporator was 10,000 gallons a day on our submarines, right. but most of that was for the reactor. That's right. Um, and we had a backup evaporator like That's this. That's right. Yep. And uh, yeah, so there was no direct drive to the Correct, shaft. no direct so it was, drive. It was motor. Diesel yeah. electric. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it would have been very, very loud in, this, in these compartments when the engines were running. The air that came from the induction piping that ran under the superstructure topside oh, into each room, there was also an opening that gave air into the maneuvering area. Mm -hmm. But that valve wasn't very high off the surface anyway, and you could take water down through. Um, not, much not much freeboard there. And, and uh, so I can only imagine the, the loys in here and then the heat, residual heat after, after shutting down. Two more, two more main diesel engines in here, and then under the deck plates in here is a small auxiliary diesel. So she could make 20, 21 knots on the surface. If she needed all four mains for propulsion, the aux diesel could charge the batteries. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're on the surface, you wanted to charge the batteries because you didn't know how long you were going to be on the surface, and then you didn't know how long your next dive was going to be. So you always wanted to. You could align any of the diesel engines to the battery charge. Correct. And maximize the battery charge. That's right. But you could align all four to propulsion and still charge with the oxygen. That's correct. The next compartment is a maneuvering room. So as you go by the cabinet, You'll see all of the switch gear and wiring. So all the uh, power generated by the generators pass through this cube. So you can kind of get a feel for the bus work and all the rheostats in here. Mm -hmm. And the electricians then stood their watch at the aft end of this compartment. And the switches were essentially manual, but Right. It's all DC, so they didn't need to parallel buses. That's right. That's correct. Didn't need to parallel anything. So there was one big switch for each of the four main generators, and then they could align for either turning the propellers. So the electric motors are underneath the cube. There's a set of reduction gears for each shaft under here, and then two shafts for propulsion. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of things that are of note is I've let these folks pass through and I'll show you a couple things on these breakers that uh, was quite a discovery here for me uh, another eye opener and we'll swap with you Karen and it's funny how much stuff we have to actually discover right yeah it's it's pretty amazing I learn something every day so these breakers are DC there's no power in here so we have people operating these all the time but um, <laughs> these breakers had a mechanical Lock. lock to lock them open. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it was that point of if this equipment doesn't run, the ship's going to sink. Right. So, you know, so run it till lock, it burns up. Lock them shut. Lock them. So, lock them shut. So the equipment yeah, so, energized. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, we need this. This is battle override. That's right. This is a battle short. Yeah. yeah mechanical battle short on those breakers. That? Incredible. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And here's the engineer order to other end computer. of the so, right. Port and starboard, starboard port, and um, you know, so when the helmsman rings up the bell, the um, motor machinist then answers the bell All right. and re by ringing up the same bell. And uh, this is on on battery. How did they control speed on uh, with the engines? So they had they could adjust with these. This was how they would see how all of them are lined up together. This is how they could adjust the RPM on the four engine to adjust the field. All so together, basically, change the RPM in the engines to change the voltage, right? To change the, the 
the speed output, yeah, right. Okay. I mean, there were real stats to increase speed here and increase the voltage, too, for battery charging. Mm -hmm. But then they generally, this would how they'd fine-tune the engine speed and shaft speed. I see. Okay. And then this was the direct outlet from the induction piping down into this cube. And I think most, fam you know, the Wahoo took a big slug of water down that coming out of on one of her patrols and was dead in the water for hours because they shorted everything out yeah, in this cube. So, yeah. right. I think they were almost to the point of ready to scuttle if they couldn't get moving. Mm -hmm. All right, we're now in the aft torpedo room. There were a couple of small office spaces or operating spaces in here. We've got one of these set up with a, quite a bit of equipment. One of the things we've just put in here is uh, another thing that Bofin got added later in the war was the ability to carry electric torpedoes. Mm -hmm. So the battery chargers for those torpedoes, there were some in the forward torpedo room, but that's... That's the charger that was here in the aft torpedo room. Mark 18. Mark 18, and then also the QD was electric. Okay, QD. C U T I. -A. Yeah, right. I know it has a designation, but I. Yeah, I <laughs> now, I talk about these counter kind of rotating screws mm -hmm. as it pertains to Japanese midget submarines. Right. Uh, and it's a very small rudder. But yep. these rudders aren't very big either. Right? No, no, they're not. On the Mark 14. And then. Uh, most of the body of the torpedo is an air tank. Right. So this whole thing was charged to about 2,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. And during the loading process, this lever was cocked. So it was put in back position mm -hmm. so that when the weapon left the tube, this popped up mm -hmm. and that supported the air into the various servers. So it got the turbine motor running. Mm -hmm. It turned up, spun up the air turn gyro, air spun gyro, and... The other shafts that were connected were up here in this area, so a couple different places. So that was depth, depth course, course, and speed. And speed. So those were how those mechanical shafts were made. Mm -hmm. And then basically the weapon left the tube, came up to its speed, came to its running depth, and turned to that gyro course, and then it ran until it hit something or ran out of air. Mm -hmm. Now with the air-driven steam torpedo that left a bubble trail sued right so that was another on a on a calm day alert lookouts might see that bubble trail and of course that pointed back to right where you were where your firing ship was yep. and you're not very fast so you're not very far away from that it's firing slower, location so it was a dead giveaway so the mark 18 torpedo then basically replaced this air body with the batteries of course the mark 18 was much slower than the than the Mark 14 torpedo, 30, 35 knots, right, and limited range compared to the steam. Steam. Right. Here's a bomb. Um, but you know, more more sailors on the rear space, and so that's a problem. Why? <laughs> right. Right. And then ask. Uh, Right. He to shoot some out too. Uh, right. Torpedoes. And then this was actually the pre most preferred berthing for the crew mm -hmm. for a, a number of reasons. One, you're a long way. That main berthing area is a passageway. Yeah. So a lot of coming and going. It's right forward to the engine rooms. So they're running. Waking up. And probably the most notable is it's the furthest away from the wardroom and the officers. <laughs> so it was a long trek back here for the officers to come back. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You and I can laugh. Yeah, about, yeah, we can. Yeah. Not. But, yeah. And anyway, it's uh, so the chief of the boat, as as we still to this day, sets the crew's berthing bill. So yep. he was the guy to keep in the good graces. Yeah, he probably wants to put the most responsible sailors back here. Since right, they're isolated. It could be very isolated. So another interesting note, and it applies to both the forward and the aft torpedo room, is these two pipes, one here and then one on the other side. You can't see it quite as well. Those are the vents for the number seven main ballast tank. Mm -hmm. So the the vent piping to those tanks goes through, the goes through the hull, both on number one and the forward torpedo room as well. Bolted flanges, you know, and it's it's there, you know one of the speculations of the loss of a lot of the submarines on their first patrols from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard was that these joints weren't made up well, and so yeah. And and I think there's another one further down at, right at the base. It's kind of hard to dig back down in there, but there's speculation that those weren't made up well, and 
you know, that's a big hole. You know, there's no way to seal it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to flood the whole compartment. And it's, it's, uh, yeah. we've come a long way in our 123 years of submarining. Right. But, uh, well, after loss of pressure, we could be blamed on brazed joints. Right. Not yeah. flanged joints, but brazed. And now right. all the right. seawater piping is welded. Right, and then the air piping with filters in it, too, that probably froze Froze the lines, froze the blow lines. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's below decks. All right, so we're standing here at the stern of the Bowfin. Beautiful day here in Pearl Harbor. You get quite an up. Most days, by the way. Yeah, it's very true. So it's pretty beautiful view. You can see the Arizona Memorial here in the background, the Missouri behind where the Arizona rests. And those white quays are where all the battleships were moored on the morning of December 7th. Right. And the brown tower over here to the side is the submarine escape trainer. Mm-hmm. That was deactivated before I... 1983. Had, I went through Did you once. go through? You yeah. did it. I didn't I get did. a chance to do it. Somebody died but, and they... Uh, that was the end of it, that huh? That was the end of that, right. No, that was deactivated before my time, but... So that's compared the sub- to the roundness of our modern submarines, here you got this nice flat deck, and it seems like we're a long way above the water, and we are for now, but when Bofin was in commission, the water line was basically the bottom of the superstructure. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're, a lot, we're a lot above the surface of the water than we would have been, and these black ports were added when the ship was decommissioned so that we could access the ballast tanks. The the louvers on the bottom of all the ballast tanks were sealed shut, so there's no water. So that's another reason we sit higher, a lot higher in the water than when the ship was in commission. It's worth saying the Tridents have a superstructure as well. Right. When I was XO of USS Florida, I had to make a couple of penetrations into the superstructure at sea, which was pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, you know, with the, our fleet submarines would carry fuel in some of the ballast tanks, mm-hmm. and once those were then transferred that fuel into the internal tanks, they could convert those tanks to ballast tanks, and men had to go under the superstructure to complete that conversion. Yeah. We lost men during, during that. Doing that on some ships. So here's the 5-inch gun, and it's got a stainless steel liner in the barrel, so it could be submerged and not be corroded. corroded. Mm-hmm. So just yeah. So just for reference, this is the other end of the pass-through for the 5-inch shells. How did they get them up here? Was, so it was like a rammer of some, so, some okay. sort. The ready shells and the detonators were in those lockers. This, this stairway wasn't here, of course. So the... There'd be a man for azimuth, the man for elevation, a gun captain. The shell would come up, it'd be loaded, the breach would be shut, and then the men learned how to time the roll of the ship mm-hmm. so that they would release their round. There was and no gyro No, no. There was on surface ships, yeah, but, but there wasn't on submarines. Right. Now, you said all of the detonators were kept up here. None of them went for inside. No, right, for safety, yep, okay. for safety. And then this is the base or the start of the adduction pipe. Mm-hmm. So the adduction valve is a 34-inch valve was in the base of the sail. So not very high above the water line, and it was, wasn't was unheard of to take water through that line. And then this ran all the length of the, under the superstructure into the two engine rooms and on into the maneuvering. 34 inches, that's a lot of water that goes into the people tank. Yeah, it was a, that's a fact. Yeah, that's a, Let's climb up on the bridge. Let's do that. Best view in the world. 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. There's another 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun on the forward end of the. So it's tough to know this, but I think this is the same 40 millimeter barrel that's on a Bofors oh. mount. On yeah. The surface ships. So, okay. And here's a um, target bearing transmitter, bearing transmitter, transmitter right. TBT, not to be confused with the TDC right. torpedo data computer, and so we have. So this was where the so this would be for the aft tubes for the captain would line up the target and transmit the bearings down to an attack. Thing I always talk about here at this station is imagine Dick O'Kane on the night of 24 October when he's fired the six bow tubes and now he's run back here to line up his attack on the aft tubes and one of his two the, battle stations look at some uh, lining these up getting ready to go. Yeah. And one of his two lookouts 
grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and said, Captain, you don't have time for that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's if you read the Clear the Bridge, it's a very subtle piece, but it's the most amazing example of forceful backup that... Uh, and it's what we expect from all of our submarine right. sailors. And he was, uh, his two battle stations lookouts were his chief quartermaster and his chief bosun's mate. And the chief bosun's mate survived, and he was the last... Uh, uh, Tang survivor to pass fairly recently, yeah. but he was he re wound up retiring as a commander after the war. He served, okay. did his did his time, and then passed. Talk about the cigarette bridge. Yeah, the leader was a lookout. Right. So these two perches were where the lookouts would stand, and most boats all also used a crow's nest. They would climb even further up on calm days to maximize their height of eye. There's a direction finding antenna up there. Yes, right? yes. And, so and there's the radar horn. Search. I think that's uh, I think that's air search. air search. And I think the other horn's been removed and we don't have it anymore. We have that other VHF antenna. Whip antenna. Yeah, yeah, VHF whip. And spotlight that's also a signal light. Right, that's right. And this is where the officer of the deck would stand his watch. He had this little platform up here. You can see the other anti-aircraft gun up forward of the of the bridge, mm -hmm. and he's got this is a speaker microphone, so he could make his reports and give his orders, align these switches for whichever station he wanted to call. There were call buttons for the wardroom and the captain. There was TBT, TBT up here and a gyro repeater. There was a speed a speed indicator, mm -hmm. and then the diving alarm for a up here is right underneath here. So that could be sounded from here to initiate that emergency dive. Mm -hmm. And then there was a collision alarm up over on the other side by by there. And then the whistle whistle could be sounded from that side too. Right. But this was no easy path. These men were standing up on these platforms. It was always the officer deck's responsibility to know how many men were up here on the bridge. And those two men would be the first two go below. Not a direct path either. They had to jump, go down and around this, down through that hatch, and then down the conning tower attached into the that's, control room. That's on the order, clear the bridge. Right. Lookouts below, they'd go down, and then off to the deck last. Last, and he'd pull the hatch shut and make the report, last man down, hatch, hatch secured. Secure. We still do that today. Mm-hmm. Done that. Quite Done that a few times, yeah. <laughs> not not with the water lapping over the hatch, no, but. No, uh, <laughs>
And we were and fortunate. Disengaging the submarines from the fleet operations right. and letting them operate on their own. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think you know, we tried to employ that for the Battle of Midway. There were almost 20 submarines employed around Midway. Only one of them made any sort of Nautilus. a contribution. Yeah. And uh, at least one of them ran aground. Right. And uh, it was pretty much a failure. And at that point on, we abandoned that. We were learning. That fleet piece. So yeah. good. We start right. in here. Mm -hmm. Let's. This is a propeller from the, one of the mini subs that Japan tried to enter Pearl Harbor with. Mm -hmm. This was a this came off the one that washed up on the beach at Bellows. That's HA-19. This is, I did a separate video, Chuck, uh, where I walk around HA-19. Oh, it's it, in the in Fredericksburg. Nimitz Museum in Fredericksburg, yeah. right? And I talk about how difficult it would have been to maneuver that submarine in Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. You know. We have big rudders on our submarines, and that little midget had a very small yep. rudder. Now, you don't have a, a midget submarine here, but you do have a kite tank. Correct. So we're going to want to look at that later okay. on. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, this depicts the attack that the award made on one of the other midget submarines. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was for years and years, this the award was discounted. And so that didn't happen. But uh, the University of Hawaii actually found that midget sub 2003 off the off the mouth of Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and there was a bullet hole right where the ward sailor said there said right there through was. the sail. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. This map lays out the Pacific at the beginning of the war mm -hmm. and shows the extent of Japan's advance into the Pacific island chains as they capitalized on the uh, mm -hmm. attack. Yeah. It's a great map we did. Um, this is San Cristobal, Guadalcanal, Florida Island, you know, Savo. Up here, we did, um, geez, 12, 13 episodes on Guadalcanal. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, we've done maybe, uh, we're, we're, we've got to be approaching eight or nine on submarines. Oh, yeah, oh, great. But, yeah, the advance up New Guinea, uh, New Britain, Rabaul. Uh, you know, so that's a, a great display mm -hmm. of this expanse. Of right. the Japanese Empire right. at this point of the war. And it really kind of shows, too, the vast distances. I mean, the scale of this is, you know, Kauai, we've got Midway, mm -hmm. and then to reach mainland Japan, and then our Asiatic fleet that then retreated mm -hmm. from the Philippines through the Indonesia and eventually down to Australia. Mm -hmm. But just the vast distances that had to be covered, and, and uh, you know, our submarines were initially went out there was no damage on the submarine base. None of the submarines that are here at Pearl Harbor were damaged. I think we only had six submarines in Portland. There weren't very many. There were, there were a number of them that were on their way here. Mm -hmm. We had submarines on practice patrols at Wake and Midway, and there were some encounters with Japanese forces at Midway, but no engagement. Mm -hmm. But these submarines were then told, you know, go, but be very careful. Mm -hmm. Travel at one engine speed. Well, one engine speed... You're going to spend half your patrol time getting to station. Then it's time to turn around. Then it's time to turn around and come home. Yeah. They were told to stay submerged during hours of daylight, which if you're only putting your periscope every very frequently, your height to eye is not very good. And then these guys got blasted for doing what their bosses said to do. Yeah. So it was no wonder that there was quite a bit of... Uh, they weren't very... Quite right. a few guys, no, no real successes on those early patrols. Mm -hmm. And then those guys... Essentially, when they were criticized that harshly, a lot of them folded and gave up. That was the failure in tactics and failure in command. And, and again, we, we, we had a lot of submarine losses before the war. So we really uh, rewarded skippers who, who operated the submarines in such a way right. that they wouldn't sink. That's right. That's and right. those are in a completely different skill set than you need during time of war. Mm -hmm. and it took us a while to figure that out. Right. And guys like Mush Morton. Right. So this this display shows some of the artifacts from the submarine Wahoo. Mm -hmm. This is the only surviving battle flag. So Mush Morton made that flag. Himself? Himself. He made yeah. that flag. The bell, it was found in a foundry after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody that was working in the foundry recognized the submarine it was from mm -hmm. and the significance so rescued it and it's on loan to us here mm -hmm. uh, he was so proud of this design yeah. that he made with the japanese flag symbolized by the feathers in the indians 
cap that he stenciled, personally stenciled yep. T-shirts for his crew members. Right. right. So here's here's actually his son Doug mm -hmm. wearing that shirt. The, the, the miniature shirt T-shirt. Right. Yeah. That's wearing that T-shirt. Uh -huh. And then uh, some of the other things in here. This is the the 28 and 29 point crib, cribbage hands mm -hmm. and a chart of the yellow sea and the charts annotated where the where those two hands were dealt mm -hmm. and you can see that signed cards are signed by the officers that were in the wardroom when it occurred it's incredible pretty wow. pretty amazing yeah that is this was donated by uh Dick O'Kane's widow after he right passed. Dick O'Kane was his uh, XO yep and yeah and what a combination that was. We talk a lot in our episode on the Wahoo about mm -hmm. Morton being smart enough to understand what his strengths were yeah. and what his weaknesses were. And, you know, using O'Kane, the right. genius, right. to fill in where he wasn't strong. Right. So this is an area where we have a lot of the family items. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the last letters between mothers and sons and wives and husbands and some of those things from some of the many sailors who were lost and we've got a lot more to catalog and scan but mm -hmm. this is something we we rotate some of the items out quite a bit here just because yeah. it's you know movies often get this aspect wrong when sailors were lost at sea in a movie you see some guy in whites walking up to the door knocking on the door to deliver the message to the mother personally with the chaplain right there were so many people being lost during the war. We couldn't do that. Right. We often notified them by telegram. Right. Imagine how devastating that would be. I mean, when the telegram, and people use telegrams for everything. Right. At any time you had a son at sea and, and somebody shows up, the telegram guy shows up, your heart has to sink. Mm -hmm. That home front aspect is, is yeah. all too incredible. And I love the flat fact yeah. that you show the blue star flag which means you have a family member serving, mm -hmm. and the gold star flag, which means you have a family member who was yep. lost yep. during the war. Yep. Um, it's a great uh, tribute here. Yep. yep. Let's just, uh, we'll just head over along this way. So okay. it shows. Shows a lot of the various things. Somebody's qual book, mm -hmm. sketchbook for Sketching systems. Had to sketch right? the systems. And Did you have to sketch the hydraulic system? I had, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Too, yeah. Right? Air yeah. system. Air system. That's trim and drain system. People wonder what these dolphins mean, whether they're officer enlisted. They mean that you have learned how to, uh, you know, how the each system on the submarine is constructed and for officers how to fight the submarine, how to actually, uh, in, you know, get in approach yeah. an attack with yeah. a submarine. Yeah. And so that's, again, something that the surface ship people, especially during the war, and to some extent even today, didn't have an analog for it. Right. right. Yeah. Right. So here's some of the, another pair of standals and some mm -hmm. of the various certificates and no. more of the pinup girls that would be in the... No, all right. So there's a shellback certificate. Um, so. <laughs> that was crossing the equator. Crossing the equator. Um, yeah. I'm a shellback, but, yeah. you know, I, I can't imagine what the shellback ceremonies were like these got, days. Got, You've got, got to be a lot tamer than they were. That toned down significantly. Yeah. Here's some of the, this is actually a, one of the mag a magnetic detonator. So there was one of the, I mean, the things that didn't work. Things that well. didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. We and did an few... entire episode on torpedo problems yep. during the war as well. Yep. And I see a firing pin as well. Yep. And so, yeah, some of the uh, issues here yep. that um, caused our failures. Yep. Just some of the things that are in our collection. Mm -hmm. Bofin had this chicken. That's a replica, but that was in maneuvering. What you know, was up with the chicken? It was just, I, I don't know what the joke was, but, you know, <laughs> put young men together and give them some idle time, and they'll come up with something to have fun with. Yeah, and yeah. Some of these drawings and sketches, every crew has an artist, and mm -hmm. these are some things. I think these are from the USS Ray. Okay. That talks about some of the things and the, the amount of time it took to draw. You know, here's 
every crew a drawing of every crew yeah. member. Yeah. He could spend a long time looking at that. And Holy cow. And the expression, there's going to be some nuance in every one of those crew members. Oh, that's right. Drawings that we, that's we right. would not understand. We, we also talk about, so these are some of the implements, you know, I, I think there were at least two appendectomies performed on yeah. submarines. And yeah. Although it was highly frowned upon, it was a matter of life or death. And, they, and they didn't have the um, antibiotics that we have today, yeah, generally how it would be treated today. Yeah. There's actually a picture. I don't know how well you'll pick it up on video. That's the growler the when she arrived in Australia after mm -hmm. the de after uh, Gilmore was lost mm -hmm. before construction. Yeah, and then down. this was a little-known story of on the USS Billfish where... Um, Coming up from Australia, leaving, coming up by Lombok and through Makassar Straits was detected and under attack. And basically, everybody up in the conning tower gave up. The captain, the XO, just laid down on the deck and were going to let fate take its course. Mm -hmm. And the engineer was Lieutenant Charlie Rush. Mm -hmm. He was a diving officer, so he was down in the control room maintaining the depth. depth. Yeah. And he was... And his chief electrician, John Rendernick, was in charge of maneuvering. And basically the crew was, most of the crew had given up. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Rush recognizes that the helm station up in the conning tower is no longer manned. That guy's laying on the deck. So he gets somebody on the helm to give a course to steer. The chief is rallying the D.C. party. They're using bucket brigade so to move water. The, because there's a helm in the control room. Right. So you get somebody in that helm. Right. Get okay. somebody to man the helm. The chief's manning a bucket brigade to move water to keep the tri ship trim. They're mm. taking on water. One of their main engines or main motors in the maneuvering area, below the maneuvering area, has come off its mount. Can't be used. They get that. They're breathing acrid air. You know, air is getting foul. So really bad. And... The lieutenant figures out they're following a bubble trail, mm -hmm. and that was how they were finding them underwater. So he executes a maneuver that we now call the Williamson turn, yep. and drives back through the bubble trail and manages. Sixty degrees, and as soon as your head swinging past sixty degrees, you reverse course to the right, right, and then and you're going down your old track, and so shakes off the attackers, and then the sun finally goes down. They've gotten far enough away. And the submarine surfaces, they manage to get at least one diesel running so they can charge a battery, get more of them online. And this was early on their patrol. They actually continued their patrol. And on their way back into Australia, the lieutenant looks at the patrol report, and there's no mention of any of this in the mm -hmm. patrol report. So he goes to the captain and tells the captain, says, if you don't tell the commodore when we get back, I will. And to his credit, the captain went up and said, I'm done, and tapped out mm -hmm. and is relieved. So that story, this story was lost to history until the late 1990s mm -hmm. when the chief, John Rendernick, who is now terminally ill, and the lieutenant went on. He served a full career, retired as a captain. Mm -hmm. So he initiates an effort to get the chief recognized for what happened all those years ago. And doesn't get the silver star in time for the chief before he passes, but got him awarded a silver star. Mm -hmm. And in the process, the lieutenant is awarded a Navy Cross. In 2002. Yeah. Incredible story. I had not heard that story. And, yeah, and I, I actually met him, Charlie Rush. He came out here when I was in command. I gave him a tour of the Key West. Uh -huh. And uh, he was out for a reunion of one of the boats he served on. And... Uh, they had a big bus load of people and came and and he comes off the bus and I've met him on the pier and he says, hey, Captain, as I want to be honest with you, I call her my daughter. She's not really my daughter and she's Australian. Is there a problem? And I said, no, welcome aboard. <laughs> but I did get to meet him and oh, it, was, it was quite an honor to, what a great to meet story. him. Yeah, it was yeah. But it leaves you to wonder how many others are like that, you know, that were, you know, never, yeah, never, yeah. ever told. So many of the boats never just never came back. That's right. You don't know why or how. So this, if you remember down on the boat, I showed you that picture of the welcome aboard pennant. Yep. So this was taken from the wing wall of that surface ship on the mm -hmm. other side of the pier. 
and I can't really tell how how many submarines every time I try to count, but all the finger piers were here, right? Mm-hmm. So I somewhere on there, you, you stare at this long enough, you can figure out that I think this is Sierra 6. Okay. So there's seven well, we on the other side of the pier and then eight and nine. So mm-hmm. that'd be four and five and three or two and three, four, five, six, seven, mm-hmm. eight, nine. But well, this we is had two finger piers when you and I were right. Four and offices. five and eight and nine were still nine. there. Yep. Yeah, but six was gone. And now. two and three were gone because the, our submarines were wider. Way than too big. Submarines. Yep. Much so bigger. We could and... Take out the middle one. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is Bofin's crew. So is this Griffith? That's that is Tyree Alec Tyree. He was okay. the last wartime CO, mm-hmm. and so the officers are here. Chiefs down here on this other side. You can see a couple of were probably stewards mm-hmm. and. Whole crew, but you know this picture. Look at, look at all these young men. Yeah. This was the A Nav. I met him before he passed away at ninety eight. Wow. And this I mentioned this was the A Ganger, the really big A Ganger. Oh look yeah, how yeah. big that guy is. With the wrench. Yeah, that was yeah. the guy with the big monkey wrench. Mm-hmm. You could see smoke. Guys blowing smoke circles. But <laughs> uh, you know, there's the home top of the homeward bound pennant. Right. Right. And the battle flags above the picture, but you can see all the claimed. Mm-hmm. Uh, sinkings yep. there's another boat with pennants flying over here too so yeah. this is late august 45 mm-hmm. i can't even imagine what pearl harbor looked like at that point you know how many boats are coming in no no and you uh, know, I, one of the things obviously there were there were about 250 ships anchored in in tokyo bay when the missouri came in september mm-hmm. uh for this to signing peace treaty uh, I wonder if there are any submarines. Yeah, there is. We'll get to the end of the gallery here. I'll okay, show great. You. Yeah, Thanks. there's there's something there. All right, good. Yep. So a lot of this video was filmed. If we wait to cycle through, there's actually some from when uh, Wahoo came in. Yeah, because I saw from our much third war patrol. You know, yeah. you can tell they're acting in, in yeah, everything. Some video. I think a lot of this you can find on YouTube. But you know, there's that's taken from the dive tower there. Yeah. This is actually the the eight ships from the Sea of Japan okay. coming in on the Fourth of July, nineteen forty five. After they return yeah, from the, the minefields, right. and then now there's, there's um, a movie destination Tokyo that Mush Morton is reported to have been technical advisor to, and then he died before the movie was released. Yeah. He's not credited in the movie mm-hmm. anywhere. So you watch the movie. Um, yeah. It doesn't say technical. In fact, it gives yeah. another submariner's name. Huh. Technical advisor. I wonder if that's because he was dead by the time. Could be. Yeah. Could be. So you, I see him in this video too. Right? Yeah. These. We have some video. This is. This is some probably post-war stuff here too. That. Yeah. Training films, but there you see the vents being. There's the maneuvering room, and yeah. they sacrificed a camera topside to get that view yeah. in those days. Last man down, hat secure. Yep, there's the... Yep. Very cool. Well, it submerges a lot faster than us. Yeah, that's a fact. Let's, uh, so we've set up a couple of stations in here of what it was like to operate the sonar system. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of see as you rotate, that would rotate the hydrophone around, and we have it programmed with some different sounds. So mm-hmm. you can hear similarly the same array listening up on that station mm-hmm. to, to manually steer it around. Mm-hmm. That was the receiver array. Yep. Okay. Whose Navy Cross is this? Uh, Griffith. Griffith. Okay. That's Griffith's Navy from Cross Bofin. from Bofin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they... Navy Cross right there. Navy Cross. Mm-hmm. That was Griffith and... He wasn't C. He was C of a bullhead, but after he left Bullhead, was she was the last submarine lost. Mm-hmm. So he knew, you know, mo- almost everybody. Yeah. And I guess he suffered personally for many, many years after I can that. Imagine. Now, in the boat, you talked about those bolts. The, these are the bolts. Here. Right. Those are yeah. Those these are the are how you set torpedo right. depth, torpedo speed, torpedo course. Right. Uh, while the, the the torpedoes in the tube. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's the... Here's the lever here where the lever that would get cocked. Yeah. And that snaps from this position to that yeah, position. Yeah. And after that, the torpedoes impulsed out, and that's how it yeah. starts the engines, yeah. essentially. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
So here's a battery cell, single battery cell from the era. Mm -hmm. Yep. But this is shorter than a normal battery cell, isn't it? Well, this was this was a uh, from World War II era. Okay. I think our modern one was a little yeah, bit bigger. About six feet. Our modern one. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Basically, this was it. 120 of those in each battery cell for okay. Bowfin, or mm -hmm. I think they went to 126 on later boats. Times two because there's two, two of them. Yeah, two batteries. There's a piston from a diesel engine, mm -hmm. and for comparison, a modern V8 mm -hmm. truck engine. So yeah, no, I've had my engines apart. Um, 16, 16 cylinders um, on the on the nuclear submarines, right? Mm -hmm. Opposed, right? Pistons, uh, so, right? Yeah. <clears throat> now, whose um, sword is this? This is Red Ramage's sword okay. and dolphins and war patrol pin. He's the one surviving skipper that I never met. Medal of Honor recipient, hmm. skipper. The, the Street, O'Kane, and Flucky I yeah. met over the course of my yeah. career. Red Ramage, yeah. I never did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was a, there's a picture, he's, they're holding that life ring, mm -hmm. you can see the life ring there that had mm -hmm. come off a, a vessel that they had sunk. Mm -hmm. And when the museum originally opened in the late 80s, uh, we had his Medal of Honor, and it was stolen. Stolen? Stolen in the late 80s. Never recovered. Pretty, pretty bad. That's cool. This uh, display shows... Some artifacts from the Tang, and that's Dick O'Kane's medal. Mm -hmm. mm. Dick O'Kane's Medal of Honor. And then this was a fairly famous picture that was in papers around the yeah. country. The yeah, yeah. he set the record for the most air air crew rescued on any one patrol. Mm -hmm. Those are the pilots that he rescued. Yep. Right. Some happy guys right there. Yep. Now you talked about these, I mean, I mean the battle flags for the submarines. Uh, anything remarkable here? I mean, there's some Maybe classics. These are some pretty pretty amazing. I mean, there was no rules or regulations for any of this, yeah. right? So it was, <laughs> they were left to their own devices with what materials they had. Mm -hmm. They all had a sewing machine like that mm -hmm. and whatever materials and scraps and whatever skills they might have had to come up with. So mm -hmm. they they were pretty imaginative. These are some of the more colorful ones that we, we have in the collection. Now, there's some in the squadron office and squadron building on subbase. Mm -hmm. Are those originals? No, I think those are all replicas. Okay. Yeah. And then these are all replicas here, too, the originals we have protected. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, yeah. You want a lot of them, once they were, you know, happy with it, then they went to a company and they mass-produced stuff for the crew. Okay. But this, uh, this video cycles through and really shows the extent of the effectiveness, so it'll reset here to the beginning of the war in a minute. But it starts with, uh, we'll let it cycle through. So these came, yeah, ships sunk in war patrols. So it'll it'll reset here to the beginning of the war here on this next one. But it shows, you know, it shows Japan's expansion and our start of war patrols. We start to hit a few sinkings. We get more, mm -hmm. more ships. They're really scattered out pretty well mm -hmm. in the South Pacific. Yeah. And, of course, yep. lanes, sea lanes that go to right. supply Japan. That's right. There's a large concentration there. Right. And then, you know, Malaya, you know, right. And then, you know, by the end of 44, you know, we've got, look at all the submarines we have. And then, yeah. then in 45, things really dried up because yeah, we had been so effective. Vietnam yep. is, is empty. Yeah, Taiwan Straits a few. That's where Tang mm -hmm. went down, right? Yep. Um, yeah, that's a great way to display it. Right. You know, then we talk a little bit about the rescue side of things too, and it never ceases to amaze me to watch this. It cycle through this video. We've mm -hmm. got uh, George Bush 
talks about his be, him being rescued, mm -hmm. and the Finback actually had a camera running. So there's when they pick him up. When right, they pick him up. So I there's actually uh, the video footage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll cycle through here. It, it amazes me, you know, all the things he talks about doing wrong. How matter of factly, any one of the things could have killed him. You know, yeah, that's wrong. Chi Chi Jima's where is Yeah, and yeah, had he, and you can actually see the island in the background of that video. Yeah, if you want, we can watch this. It's when I was um, jail on Indianapolis. I did three tours on Indy. He came aboard as vice president for a tour, and he said. This is the second time I've been on the submarine. <laughs> yep. When we were at the Aviation Museum, we looked look at the airplane. See how difficult it was going to be for his crew members to get out. Oh, yeah. It is not surprising no. that he did not survive. Yeah. And I knew I was in serious trouble. I saw that I couldn't possibly fly this plane back to the ship. And, uh, yes, and Jim was all happening very fast. I made an exit from the plane, dove out onto the wind, did it very badly. Uh, I pulled the ripcord too soon. I hit my head on the tail of the horizontal stabilizer of the DBF. And a uh, glancing blow like this, and bleeding like a stuck pig. And uh, the parachute momentarily hung up on the tail of the plane and it ripped out some of the, some of the uh, panels. Of shoot, so I fell faster than I normally would have. And uh, but I failed to put my seat pack on, put my life jacket, my life uh, life boat onto the onto the uh, parachute. So the fighter plane came, dove down, showed me where that was, and I swam over, got into this life raft, uh, and uh, started paddling as fast as I could to go out to sea. The wind was blowing towards Chi Chi. And I was I was flying toward Chi Chi also. I swam as fast as I could. I was sick in my stomach. I was scared. Uh, and uh, I wondered what happened to my crewmen. And suddenly I saw this, this, this periscope. It looked like that would be left somewhere and got me the water. If they weren't otherwise occupied, it would be a submarine. And they'd check in somewhere and say, we're in this area. So when I went down, it was just... Skipper and I squad used that frequency to tell where the submarine was listening. This is the pilot's cabin. Here's where he is. The USS came back. It came alongside and picked me up. So you can see the island in the background mm -hmm. back there. Yeah. Back down again. They got pretty close to the island. Uh, earlier from, uh, from Iwo Jima, I think it was, or Hawkeye Jima, which was another island there. And then me. And then after, <laughs> after I was safely on board, we went in and pulled another guy out and some deck men at the end of the box. And uh, it, it was very lucky the submarine was there because, as I said, it was going south, and I knew that I would be, if it did, if somebody didn't pick me up, I would have been uh, captured and killed. They were very brutal. <laughs> yeah, yep. pretty, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So this was a late addition to our museum. It's worth talking a little bit about. One of one of Bofin's attacks turned out sank a ship that was carrying school children from Okinawa in advance of the invasion. Mm -hmm. After what had happened in Saipan and Tinian with all the suicides, right. the Imperial Japan didn't want that sort of thing to happen again, so they were evacuating civilians and children off of Okinawa. And unknowing to Bofin at the time, it was a legal target. Mm -hmm. She sank that ship. And survivors were sworn to secrecy never to reveal what had happened. Because they didn't Japan Japan was Imperial Japan was worried about the outcry in the country for mm -hmm. that thing. Mm -hmm. So they were sworn to secrecy, and finally, many, many years later, some of the survivors spoke up. And there's actually a small museum in Okinawa that commemorates this. Mm -hmm. And we got a request. We took a hard look at it. We felt we had a good place for it here. So we developed this with the local Okinawan community, put this together. And we've had 
Okinawan school children here, and they've seen this display. Mm. It's been very well received. No, it's good. You know, it's, it's important to reflect the war in all of its brutality mm -hmm. and all of its tragedy. And right. This was, was not intentional. Right. Other submarines sunk ships carrying prisoners of war. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, that's it's important that we not gloss over right. the true impact of war. Right. Because, you know, absolutely. All of the lessons learned, not just some of them. That's right. You know, and here's a example. This is the Grunion. They're having their farewell party in June of 42, mm -hmm. and she's lost on her first patrol off mm -hmm. uh, up in the Aleutian chain. Mm -hmm. So all these ladies were widows mm -hmm. just a few months after this picture was taken. Yeah. This is um, the quote of Nimitz here. We shall never forget our submariners that held lines against the enemy while our fleets would face losses and repaired wounds. Yep. And we talk a lot about that in our podcast, that it was, it was the naval aviation and the submarines. Right. Because the service force was essentially decimated right. here in Pearl Harbor, and it took a while to recover. Right. But naval aviation and submarines got the job done while right. those fleets were able to recover. So this picture was taken on September 2nd, 1945, on the Yokosuka Naval Base. This is all the submarine officers that were present in Yakuska for the surrender. This is Admiral Lockwood mm -hmm. here in the middle. And when he took command of sub -PAC in early 43, he sent a message out to his uh, captains, and he said, I look forward to joining you for a drink at the submarine-based Yakuska Officers Club after we've whipped the Japanese. So there were 12 submarines and a submarine tender. There's a picture of the Proteus with her 12 submarines over there. We can get a shot of that on the way out. Mm -hmm. But these men came in in preparation. They went ashore, disabled weapons, made sure there were no booby traps, mm -hmm. cleaned up areas. You know, some of the stories of, the, of the, what they found ashore was just atrocious, right. you know, the sanitation. And they basically came back to the tender at night stripped off their clothes and burned them because they were just covered in bugs and, and everything. But uh, after the ceremony on the Missouri, Admiral Lockwood came ashore. These are probably his senior staff officers, mm -hmm. captains. Um, this is uh, Joe Vasey, who was a longtime Hawaii resident, passed away just shy of his 101st birthday. I was at his 100th birthday party. This is John McCain's father, who was a submarine commander. He was actually the captain of the ship that this guy was XO of, and he was a four-star admiral when his son was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Right, right. he was, was St. Pac. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible photo. Yeah. You know, like you, had probably been to Yokosuka um, a dozen times. Many times, yeah. And, and, my, and I do not remember this arch. I don't know where this photograph is taken. Yeah, no idea where the building yeah. is. I mean, it, even... The last time I was there, the only building of any recognition was where the building that the sanctuary was in. Yep. And it was, I don't know, maybe it's gone now. I have no yes. idea. They put a parking lot on one side of that building, mm -hmm. and that parking lot has proximity alarms around the corners. So from 4 in the morning to 8 in the morning, you hear those alarms going off, alarms going off yeah. in that building. It's, and there was a radio, the naval the telemetry station there. Yeah. Um, but the other thing Nimitz did right away, as soon as we were occupied the naval station near Costco, was um, protect Admiral Togo's ship mm -hmm. from being, you know, right, uh, right, analyzed, right, um, because he had actually had got to know Togo a bit mm -hmm. and had respect for him, right, because Togo was long dead before World War II began, right, Mikasa. Mikasa, yep. that's it. Andy. And then, you know, I guess the uh, last point is sometime while you and I were on active duty, they unsealed a chamber on Yokosuka Naval Station, mm. and they found a bunch of remains mm. of human beings that had been sealed in this chamber that it was later determined to be Korean, quote-unquote, laborers, sl slaves, um, not not known why. I think this was in the 90s mm. when they discovered this wow. chamber. Not known why, 
his laborers were killed mm -hmm. in that fashion. Yeah. Um, um, and I was I was disappointed at the time that the event didn't receive wider attention yeah. in Japan. Yeah, I I didn't I didn't know about that. I, all I know is you walk around the base and there's all kind of off limit signs. You're not allowed to go into these in a lot of caves. Right. I mean, from the sanctuary, you can see caves bored into Absolutely. the side of the hills and everything. And most and, of them sealed. Right. 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 But yeah, it's mm. it's pretty amazing. And all that was off limits. Not allowed to go into any of that stuff. So. Right. Yeah, I have no idea where that building was. I think almost anything that was there when you and I would have visited it had all been modernized. Like I yeah. said, the last time I was there, the sanctuary building was there, but uh, today's may well have been numbered. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so this final picture here is the submarines and, and uh, the submarine tender that was in Tokyo Bay on the, for the surrender. This is an interesting moorage, right? So the the tender is anchored, and all of these submarines are moored to the tender, right. nested to the tender. And yep. that had one, two, three, four, five. Six on each side. Yeah, that's right, 12. It's incredible with the CO's name. Mm -hmm. And most of them were commanders late in the war. Right. Um, rather than lieutenant commanders, but a few yep. lieutenant commanders. Um, wow, what a photo. So you answered my question. Yeah. I didn't know we had submarines yeah. anchored in, in the bay yep. during the signing. And now yep. I know. Yep. Yep. Good. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So the Kaiten was the submerged kamikaze weapon. Mm. So forward end of the of this was a three thousand pound warhead. This this whole bit of it, and then. There was a operating station here in the middle, this small sail. It had a periscope in it, mm -hmm. and the aft end of it was the fuel tank and engine for this weapon. Because the pilot, the guy who's committing suicide, um, had to see where he's going. There's no guidance, so it's not like they would run deep. They would no. run at right up the surface. periscope death right at the surface. Right. And Japanese submarines, the I-Class, often carried six of these things right. topside. And right. In fact, there's um, the I-58 that sunk the Indianapolis. Ned Beach, in the opening to Hashimoto's book, the, Amer the English edition of Hashimoto's book, says that he doesn't believe Hashimoto when he says he sunk the Indianapolis with torpedoes. He believes that Hashimoto used Kaiten. Hmm. And it wasn't until 2017 when we found the Indianapolis did we know with certainty Hashimori was telling the truth? He did not use Kaiten mm -hmm. to sink the Indianapolis. But the Kaiten, but, but he had six Kaiten mm -hmm. that were launched sometime during that patrol. These once launched, this guy's going to Oh, yeah, die. he's done. He's not going to come back. Yep. He, they would, uh, once the hatch was shut, he couldn't open the hatch. The, the pilot couldn't mm -hmm. open the hatch. This was a dangerous weapon. I mean, there were several, even the, the inventor died in an accident. Mm hmm. So there was there were co-inventors and the, really the lead advocate was a fairly young naval officer. He died in the in the training, and his, and the other guy carried his ashes when they carried the, out the attack on the Mississauga, mm -hmm. and that guy also perished. But he that was one of the few successful uses of this weapon. The Mississauga and the Underhill. Yep. yep. In the war, that, right. I think that was. But that was it. So it was July of 45. Yeah. So it was a desperation weapon. Um, once they launched, they had a compass. We may not have it in here. And and, and they would basically just maintain a DR. They knew they were going to go a certain distance. They could throttle the engine so they could control their range a little bit. But uh, they also had a device where they could uh, self detonate their weapon if they failed in their mission they could mm -hmm. just at least kill themselves and mm -hmm. detonate the weapon but yeah. very little in terms of of uh, control and uh, like the midget submarines this rudder is tiny right it? yeah that's what we can walk and so he's not going to be able to turn tight right is he going to get into a tail chase right eventually unless he leads the target right he's leading the target ship 
If he fails How to do you? that, he's going to end up in a tail chase. Right. And if he can't turn fast enough, he's going to miss. Yeah, right. That's good. Yeah. We can pick up um, when we were talking about the rudder and its stern. Sure. This is kind of a cutaway. Shows the engine mount, but mm -hmm. you know what the this used liquid, you know, oxygen propulsion, you know, which you know we knew the Kursk had a torpedo that blew up, right? So mm -hmm. same sort of technology that the Japanese mastered. They knew how to keep things clean enough. You had to have pure. You had to mm -hmm. have pure, and you had to have good piping. And mm -hmm. they figured out the technology to make this all work. But the pilot could control the speed to somewhat. But then once he had, was lined up for his attack. He would run at maximum speed right into the target, and the Mississauga was at anchor, so it wasn't a moving target. So yeah, it, the underhill was underway. I mm -hmm. think when they, when it yeah. got sunk, yeah, yeah, it wasn't going fast. Yep. Yeah, because these weren't very. Uh, was it 35 knots? I yeah, can't remember. They were relative. Yeah, 35, 40 or so in that mm -hmm. max speed, but mm -hmm. but again, yeah, like you said, the control surface is not. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> the um, yeah, the stern planes are actually pretty beefy here. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, and again, these rudders look like they're big, but these this is a cutaway of a, of the you know horizontal, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the vertical stabilizer, mm -hmm. and it's just that's not going to create a lot of turbulence to kick this massive piece right. of steel around. Right. So yeah, they uh, seem. I don't know why they did it on both the Kaiten and the Vlad yeah. and the midget submarines now. Right. One midget submarine we know with certainty got in, into Pearl Harbor right. during the attack. One that was sunk on the west side of Fort Island. It's H A twenty I twenty two Tau. Um, so it was good enough, right? I guess you had to be lucky. Had to be lucky, yeah. Right, and, and that pilot of that midget was the was only lieutenant was the instructor. Oh, so yeah, again, yeah, yeah like that Mississauga attack. He was one of the developers, right? So right. he had the most time and the training and yeah, and. Good. Uh, well, yeah. thanks, Chuck. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything on the cutie? No. We've got a cutie over here. Okay. We can we can Let's do just that. right there. Mm -hmm. Keep rolling, keep rolling then, honey. Okay, Mark 27. Oh, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the first uh, aerial, or not aerial, homing weapons developed mm -hmm. so if you look up here on the on the nose the sensor's gone but this actually was a passive acoustic sensor and the other it was used during world war ii used during world war ii and you'll see these got some extensions on the body of this thing mm -hmm. because it was a 19 inch weapon so these were added so that it fed in the 21 inch too and it was a battery powered weapon mm -hmm. small warhead but what this was designed to do was for if a ship was under attack, depth charge attack, mm -hmm. they would launch these out of the aft tube and it would spiral mm -hmm. up. And it was looking for the cavitation from the attacking craft and home on that and detonate. And it wasn't a huge warhead, but it was enough to cause damage. And yeah. there's a number of sinkings credited to the cut into these weapons. Mark 27 cuties. Yeah, and they call it a cutie because it was they could carry two of them in one load line for the Mark 14, 14. or 18. Mm -hmm. It was battery powered, so they had to, like the Mark 18, so they had to have battery chargers to mm -hmm. keep the batteries. And like I said, it did a spiral maneuver and... If it detected something, it ran up and... We were still trying to break the code on wake homing torpedoes during the Cold War. And we had an early version of one during right. World War II. That's right. Incredible. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> well, Chuck, I wanted to thank you for taking us on this tour of the Bofin and the Pacific Submarine Force Museum. These are incredible um, treasures for anybody interested in World War II. Yep. And I encourage anybody who comes to Pearl Harbor, you gotta see this place, yep. right? Uh, yeah, you can't talk about World War II without talking about submarines, and this is the best place, yep. the best submarine museum in the United States, in my opinion. Yep. Thanks. I hope you agree. <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, I, I think it's, uh, you know, both in, only about 15 fleet boats left, mm -hmm. and some of those are really threatened. Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate that we're in a good position. We're gonna keep both in safe and suitable for as long as we physically can. It's, yeah. All right. Thank All right, you so thanks much. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Bill. Yeah, yep, thanks. Take care. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bill. You too. We've already visited the Submarine Force Pearl Harbor Museum, and I said, 
no visit to Pearl Harbor would be complete without a visit there. Well, similarly, no visit to Pearl Harbor would, would be complete without a visit to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Okay, Captain Bill Toady here at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, and I'm so pleased to have our docent, Eric Pradle, with us here today. He's an expert on all the World War II stuff. Now, let me tell you, folks, if you make it to Hawaii, you got to visit the Arizona. It's a solemn place, uh, you know, and you got to go there. I said before, you got to visit the boat fin and the submarine, for, for submarine museum of the Pacific. And this is the third must-see museum, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. There's so much good stuff, not just World War II related, but of course today we're going to be focusing on the World War II related yeah, stuff. Is that right, Eric? Absolutely. Okay, great. This great old sign yeah. is is very symbolic, but this is a sign that was frequently shown to sailors in the 1930s and 1940s to get them to be willing to come out here and serve in Pearl Harbor. It uh, doesn't have much to do with the Navy. <laughs> it's a great yeah. sign. Yeah, it? it's, a, it's a great one. It's an iconic sign uh, mm -hmm. that many people are familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. good. All right, so we're going to walk yeah. down this way, and we're going to start looking around. So when we talk about the attack on Pearl Harbor, there is no more iconic aircraft than the one that's behind us. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us about this, Eric? Yeah, so this aircraft right here is a Mitsubishi A6M20 fighter, uh, the primary fighter aircraft of the Imperial Navy. Uh, they had several models of it, but this is the A6M2 version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, same version that they used here at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And this is not an airplane that flew in the attack on Pearl Harbor, no. right? No. Yeah. But if there's no other reason for you to come to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, this is enough to draw you here just by itself. This, you know, it, there are times during my podcast where I, I kind of talk about the... Mm -hmm. Wildcat mm -hmm. and its inferiority yeah. compared to the Zero, and and honestly, some of our viewers yeah. have gotten on me for that. They, mm -hmm. they they say I'm a little hard on the Wildcat, and you know, the, even though they'll admit the Hellcat was a better airplane. Yeah. How did this airplane uh, perform vis-a-vis -vis the Wildcat? Now we we also talk about things like the thatch yep. weave, yep. right? That yeah. our pilots learn to do to, to overcome mm -hmm. those deficiencies. But yeah. there are other things that they pilots could do to overcome the deficiencies yeah. of the yeah. airplanes? So, uh, one of the best known tactics that U.S. pilots used was the thatch weave, the weaving back mm -hmm. and forth so you can defend the back end mm -hmm. of your, uh, your wingman. Uh, but that's because uh, the Zero had a tendency to turn quicker mm -hmm. uh, than U.S. aircraft did at that time. They have large control surfaces which allowed it to turn much tighter at slower speeds. But at higher speeds, they lost that maneuverability. Mm -hmm. Around 200 to 250 miles an hour, they started to lose the ability to turn to the right. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. found that out by recovering one that crashed in Alaska in June of 1942. Mm -hmm. uh, so another tactic that several pilots would use is uh, they'd use what we, we call here at the museum the boom and zoom tactic. They'd come in over the top, try and dive down on them, try and shoot them down that way. And if you don't, keep diving. And when you get to that critical speed point and you're close enough to the ground to safely turn to the right, try turning to the right, and if that zero tries to follow you, they Maybe might just crash right into the ground. Drink. Yep. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. So how many of these zeros in this condition do you think still exist in the world? Uh, in this condition, this one's actually still flightworthy. Uh, it's still really? classified as flightworthy when it arrived here at the museum, and there were only about seven of them at the time. Holy yeah. cow. Uh, I believe there's... 12 of them on display, I mm -hmm. believe. Around the world? Yep. yep. Amazing. Yeah. This is a beautiful airplane, mm -hmm. and you can understand, you know, why we had such trouble with it in the early yeah. phases oh, of yeah. the war. Mm -hmm. But, of course, over the course of the war, that did change. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we know of several um, zeros during the attack mm -hmm. on Pearl Harbor that did end up crashed mm -hmm. around the island. In fact, there was a rumor when I was a junior officer here, mm -hmm. we would bushwhack through the hills of Iaea. Yeah. Because there was a story that there was one crashed up there. There was mm -hmm. a crashed airplane, but I never yeah. found evidence that it was actually <laughs> yeah. zero. But but there was one crashed on the island of Niihau, mm -hmm. wasn't there? Yes. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't Kama'aina Hawaiian um, the residents, Niihau is a closed island. It's privately owned. And for years and years, for decades, 
only Native Hawaiians could live on that island. Mm -hmm. But there were two or three Japanese living on the island at the time yep. of the attack on yep. Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And so what happened? Tell us the story. Yeah, so um, the wreckage that we have behind us is actually wreckage of the Zero that crash landed there. And it was piloted by a young Japanese pilot, Airman First Class Shigenori Nishikaichi, who was involved in the second wave of the attack over Kaneo and Naval Air Station, that area. Uh, got a few bullets to his wings, uh, hit the fuel tanks, was leaking fuel. And um, they didn't have the self sealing yep, They did not have self-sealing self, like self tanks like yeah. American planes had, right. yeah. So uh, he remembered his briefing. He was leaking too much fuel, knew he wouldn't be able to make it back to his aircraft carrier to the north. So his briefing that morning told him, if you can't make it back to your carrier, you can take a shorter flight to a flat, dry lake bed on the island in Neatenhow. Little did the Imperial fleet know, though, the owners of that island, the Robinson family, went out and in the late 1930s, early 1940s, picked up a tractor, which we have on display here, and started cutting up that lake bed in a tic-tac-toe type fashion with four-foot deep furrows to prevent that lake bed from being used as an airfield. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they were tipped off that that lake bed could be used as an airfield from a report that came out in 1924 by General Billy Mitchell. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Japanese pilot crash lands on that lake mm -hmm. bed. It's not a you know, flat lake no. surface anymore. No. So the airplane breaks yeah. apart. He, mm -hmm. he gets knocked out. Yep. What happens then? Yeah, so he was knocked out. The locals came up, opened up the cockpit, got him out, nursed him back to consciousness. Uh, they had, didn't have a working radio at that time, so they didn't know what was going on here at the island of Oahu and Pearl Harbor. Uh, so they nursed him back to consciousness, well, threw him a welcome luau that evening, mm -hmm. uh, and he stayed on that island for about a week. Uh, but over the next few days, they started to get bits and pieces on what was going on over here. So they placed the pilot, uh, Nishikaichi, into house arrest uh, to be taken care of until the military authorities could come out mm -hmm. and uh, take him into custody. Uh, well, in that time, though, one of the local Japanese Americans who lived on the island, Mr. Harada, uh, worked for the Robinsons, so he was able to live there on the island as well, uh, was put under his care as an interpreter mm -hmm. uh, so they could find out more of what was going on and use him to find out what the pilot was saying. And at one point, they were left alone, and the pilot talked to Mr. Harada uh, and said, hey, can we find my pistol and papers that were taken away when I crashed? So they went into another house to find that, found the pistol, didn't find the papers, also found a shotgun and took several people captive. Two of these people were Ben Kanahele and his wife Ella, two native mm -hmm. Hawaiians that lived on the island. And Mr. Kanahele mm -hmm. is a big guy. He's a sheep shearer <laughs> by trade. Many Hawaiians uh, are. Yeah. Man. And um, uh, didn't really like being held captive at all, like most people mm -hmm. wouldn't. So at one point he rushes at the pilot to overtake him, but the pilot pulls his pistol and he shot him three times. Mm -hmm. Once in the chest, once in the stomach, and once in the leg. Uh, but small caliber pistol slowed him down a little bit, but he kept rushing at him, got to the pilot. They wrestled with each other a little bit. Eventually, Mr. Kanahele picks the pilot up, threw him against a rock wall, knocking him out yet again. And to finish off the pilot, Mr. Kanahele's wife, Ella, a little bit upset about her husband being shot three times, picked up a large rock and dropped it right on the pilot's head. Uh, yep. That killed him. Yep. Yeah, so you know the, the whole bit about the Japanese-American mm -hmm. um, aiding and comforting the enemy mm -hmm. here, although they weren't quite sure yeah. what was going on in Oahu at the time. Uh, if those of you that do internet research may see something along the lines of that aid and assistance was used as justification for the imprisonment of Japanese Americans on mainland mm -hmm. uh, United States. And in fact, if, if you look through the actual documents that record the conversations that led to that policy, I see no evidence that they ever even talked about the Harada, mm -hmm. Harada right? Yeah. The yeah. Harada case and the, and the aid that Harada mm -hmm. gave to this Japanese pilot. So I think those are completely unrelated. If you see yeah. that on the Internet, you should discount it. It was a policy that was born in error and, and, and should never mm -hmm. have been done. And yeah. this certainly wasn't justification yeah. for it. Yeah. I've right. seen no connection between the two as well right. in all my research. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, you don't just have Navy and Marine Corps mm -hmm. airplanes here at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Yep. Um, you also have Air Army airplanes, mm -hmm. no surprise there. But there's something different about this airplane. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, so we got an uh, Army B-25 Mitchell bomber uh, on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're talking about the Doolittle Raid yep. here. Now, we, we talk about the Doolittle Raid on mm -hmm. our podcast. Yeah. And I talked about the fact that 
Jimmy Doolittle, when he lived in Carmel, California, mm -hmm. and I was in Monterey going to graduate school, I got to meet. And what a legend that guy is. And, oh, and yeah. when you see the size of this airplane, mm -hmm. it's, it's about the size of an A3D whale, a yep. more modern jet yeah. airplane, but propellers, right? Yep. And the fact that they can get this thing up to takeoff mm -hmm. speed and yeah. rotate yeah. on the deck of the Hornet, mm -hmm. when you see it, you say, nah, nah, yeah. it can't be done. But as we know, they did it. So mm -hmm. what about this airplane specifically um, should we know about? Um, with this one on our deck here, it's got a very special piece to it right here on the wheel well cover mm -hmm. of the nose gear. And we have two signatures of Doolittle Raiders themselves. Come on up. We have a signature of uh, Richard Cole, co-pilot for Doolittle's plane number one. And also Tom Griffin, who I believe was a navigator on plane number seven. Plane number seven. Yep. So two actual Doolittle yep. Raiders. Now those guys obviously they survived the war. Yep. They both crash landed in China. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, yeah, I, get, I can imagine they had some incredible stories oh, yeah. to tell. Yeah. And uh, they both signed this aircraft on the opening day of this museum. Is that right? Yep. Now were either of them taken prisoner or did they both get out? To be honest, I'm not too sure. Well, I, I know. I, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, with Richard Cole, I believe he got out. Got I'm out. not too sure about yeah. uh, Tom Griffin. Yeah. yeah. Again, so many iconic pieces here at the Pearl yeah. Harbor Aviation Museum that just must be seen mm -hmm. by any true um, lover of World War II history. Okay. So, Dauntless. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the Dauntless yeah. from the Battle of Midway, yes. right? Yeah. But it predates Midway. Mm -hmm. We had Dauntless flying at Coral Sea. Can you tell us about this airplane? Yeah, so this airplane right here is an SPD-2, uh, the P variant, so photo reconnaissance variant. There were only about 14 of this type built with, mm -hmm. for photo reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one uh, delivered to the Navy uh, spring of 1941, flew photo reconnaissance off the Enterprise for a little bit. Then it wound up at an aircraft pool in San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where it was on December 7th during the attack here. Mm -hmm. Then eventually in January of 42, it wound up right here on an aircraft pool on Ford Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point in spring of 42, it was loaded on the deck of the USS Yorktown, uh, which uh, made its way down to the Coral Sea area. And uh, this aircraft was on the Yorktown at Coral Sea. Uh, I haven't been able to find out if it actually flew up in into the, the skies at mm -hmm. the battle. Uh, but we do know it is one of the few aircraft that was able to fly off of the Yorktown when it was coming into Pearl Harbor here uh, for the three days of repairs after it was damaged at Coral Sea. Yeah, which is, again, another incredible story. Yeah. Stuff of legend, oh, yeah. his involvement, get the Yorktown turned around so it could mm -hmm. show up at the Battle of Midway. Yep. So I assume that when Yorktown got underway for the Battle of Midway, this airplane wasn't on board. Uh, this aircraft was not on board at that point. Um, yeah. When it flew off, it was replaced with another set of aircraft. Uh, it stayed here on Ford Island for a little bit and then was transferred to training squadrons uh, yeah. on the mainland. Wow. Yeah. Well, we talk a lot in the, in the podcast about the, the, the pilot and the gunner. Yep. We're going to show that in a second. Mm -hmm. But this, remember, these gunners were facing rearward yeah. as, as, you know, trying to shoot <laughs> yeah. airplanes behind them. And you can imagine what that was like mm -hmm. when they were in the dive. I yeah. Mean, I, I can't even begin to imagine what this would have been like. Yeah, I I couldn't either. I mean, yeah, that it'd be a ride of a lifetime. It would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be a roller coaster like oh, you've yeah. never experienced oh, a yeah. life or death roller yep. coaster. Yeah, somehow, Eric, I left the impression with some of our viewers that I'm hating on the Wildcat, the F4F. I am not hating on the Wildcat. I just, I just did say what the pilots themselves said early in the war, yeah. which is that they needed a better airplane, which they eventually got with the Hellcat. Mm -hmm. But this is a Wildcat. And, and we, just so you know, we did do an episode on the Cactus Air Force okay. and yeah. talked about Wildcats flying on, mm -hmm. out of Guadalcanal. We did a bunch of episodes on Guadalcanal, yeah. but one specifically on the Cactus Air Force. So can you talk to us about okay. this airplane? Yeah, so this is our F4F3 uh, variant of it. Um, uh, this is only one of, I believe, two F4F3s with fixed wings on it. Hmm. it this one was used as a training qualification carrier landing aircraft, so right. it didn't need the folding, folding wings. wings. Yeah. So it's actually got fixed wings well, on it. Well, it didn't need it on Guadalcanal either. No, right? yeah. yeah. But most of the Wildcats, if I'm not mistaken, they got to Guadalcanal, got there off of a carrier. Yeah. So they would have needed yeah. them for the carrier. Yep. Design, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, this one um, on our floor here has an interesting backstory to it. Um, 
it was, as I mentioned, a training aircraft mm -hmm. on carrier qualifications. And it wound up at the bottom of Lake Michigan um, in 1943, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. June of 43, it went into the lake. And it was brought up from the bottom in December of 1991, January of 1992. Wow. Yeah. Well, the Great Lakes are yep. really cold. Really cold. And not salt yep. water. Yep. And, and if they get deep enough, they don't have a lot of oxygen, mm -hmm. so they won't grow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and this so, was about... Lucky. 250 feet down, I believe it was, yeah, or somewhere wow. around there, yeah. yeah. It was basically uh, functional when it was brought up as well. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, the, the deck here yep. that we're talking about, go come on up and, and let's see the deck, because we talk about this as well mm -hmm. on Guadalcanal, because it was a mud pit. Yeah. And so how do we overcome that? Uh, to overcome that, our uh, construction battalions, airfield makers basically went out, leveled it out as much as they could and laid this matting down mm -hmm. uh, to give some structure to that surface that they were on and yeah. being able to take off and land. Yeah, it helped some, but it wasn't 100%. No, effective. no, no. They still had issues with mud <laughs> yeah. on Guadalcanal yep. throughout the war, um, even where we had many, many air fields yeah, and yeah. we were using it basically as a training base mm -hmm. later. Yeah. So, wow, a wildcat, but not with folding wings. Yeah. So, Eric, we recently did an episode on VMF-214, mm -hmm. the Black Sheep Squadron, mm -hmm. and actually I learned a few things from, from viewers during the feedback on that yeah. episode, but of course that's where the famous Marine Corps pilot, Pappy mm -hmm. Boynton, yep. the, the squadron that he commanded, but before he commanded VMF-214, mm -hmm. he was a member of the Flying Tigers in China. Yep. Yep. Um, so what can you tell us about this airplane? Yeah, so this uh, aircraft right here is... Uh, uh, P-40 Warhawk, mm -hmm. uh, and this is the type of aircraft that the Flying Tigers were using over in China. Yeah. Uh, and this one right here um, is painted up exactly how they would have been painted. Is that right? Time. Yeah. For flying Tigers? Yep, for Flying Tigers. Got the Flying Tiger logo right there. Uh -huh. Got the Hells Angels squadron painted on the front end as well. Right. One of their three squadrons. How about that? Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, Pappy's boss in, in, in Tigers, his name was Chenault. Yep. And... And Pappy def definitely got credited for two air-to-air mm -hmm. -air kills yep. while in the Flying Tigers yeah. and tried to take credit for two air-to-ground kills. Yep. And, and Chenault, neither Chenault <laughs> nor the Marine Corps would give him credit yeah. for those yep. two air-to-ground kills. Yeah. Uh, as I joked in the in the episode, if air-to-ground kills worked in artillery, then it could become mm -hmm. aces, yeah. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> You know, you know, what's, who's the photo of here? Uh, so this photo in the back is a group of flying tiger pilots sitting mm -hmm. on one of their aircraft. How's that yeah. right? Or yeah. Pappy's in that photo um, Not too sure. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so we have not yet done an episode on the Battle of Chichijima, mm -hmm. where a famous American was shot down. Yeah. And that famous American has some history with this airplane yeah. uh, here. Doesn't look like a World War II airplane, does it? But go ahead and give us that yeah. history. So this aircraft here is a Boeing Stearman, also known as the N2S3 in naval terms, mm -hmm. or the PT-17 Cadet in uh, Army terms. This was one of the main primary training aircraft of World War II for the United States. So most pilots flying up in the skies for the U.S. learned how to fly airplanes on one just like this. And uh, this one on our floor, it's fairly special to us. Uh, it's one of the three or four main primary training aircraft of George Herbert Walker Bush himself, the 41st mm -hmm. president. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, George H.W. Bush, um, right here is his photograph, mm -hmm. was shot down at the Battle of Chichijima, survived, yeah. picked up by a submarine. I might mm -hmm. add the USS Finback. Yeah. We submariners are very proud of that. Oh, yeah. And he actually toured my submarine, the USS Indianapolis, not while I was CEO, but when I was junior officer, and oh. I got his autograph then. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about, I think he said to me, at the time that this was the, only the second time he'd been on a submarine, <laughs> and this time was better than the first. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you were rescued by the first time, but I think he was thinking about the fact he had been shot down. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. So this yeah. was actually yep. not not a replica, but this nope. is actually one yep. of the planes that he yep. made. We have the log books used. with uh, the matching tail numbers and bureau numbers of this aircraft. As so well. he actually flew this yep. airplane. Yep. Amazing. Mm hmm. So, Eric, this might not have been a combat aircraft, but it was one of the most an extremely important aircraft right. throughout the conduct of the war. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why? Yeah, so this uh, is a C-47. Uh, this is what was used to transport most of the equipment, most of the troops around, mm -hmm. um, uh, paratroopers, iconic aircraft from D-Day. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, paratroopers jumping out of these, transported troops around the South Pacific as mm -hmm. well. Uh, equipment used as a flying laundry mat, pretty <laughs> much. Uh, chaplains getting them to the people mm -hmm. out at the front. Uh, but it could be used uh, for anything, pretty mm -hmm. much, that you needed. Later on in Vietnam, put a whole mm -hmm. bunch of guns in it, made it into a, a gunship as well. Nice and slow yeah. and low, right? Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. One of the last mm -hmm. tail draggers that yeah. I guess we flew during the Vietnam War. I think the OV-1 was ob observation aircraft mm -hmm. was a tail dragger as well. But yeah. this this airplane's in remarkable shape. Oh, yeah. Where did it come from? Uh, we actually acquired it from the airport, Honolulu International Airport. Really? Yeah. They had it? it? They had it over there. It was uh, flying up until the early 2000s, I believe, with a cargo company over there. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Erica, during my tenure here in Pearl Harbor, yeah. which has lasted quite a long time, the control tower here on Fort Island was in great jeopardy. Oh, yeah. It was falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, the Navy was trying to use appropriate funds to fix it. And year after year after year, there's their military construction funds. Uh, they would get removed from the mm -hmm. budget and things like that. And, and there was a period of time when we were worried the sucker might actually fall down. Yeah. And like I say, there's the, the dive tower on submarine base and this control tower on Fort mm -hmm. Island. They were important for a bunch of reasons, not historical, but like they were used as landmarks yeah. by the pi Japanese pilots yeah. that were taking, conducting the attack. I'm so happy to see that the mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is now actively using the buildings. Yep. When mm -hmm. I was here as Commodore, those buildings were abandoned and they were yeah. really, really bad mm -hmm. shape. So yeah. can, can you tell us anything yeah. about this? So uh, we've been working on the, the operations building complex since mm -hmm. I believe it was 2010 when the project started. Okay. Uh, and uh, Biggest part was the stabilization of the tower. We right. put over 40 tons of steel into there to, to stabilize it so it mm. won't fall over. Right. Uh, before we started, it looked like a sudden wind gust could blow it over. Right. Uh, but that project took a little while. We got it repainted. We redid the elevator in the box in the elevator shaft there. And uh, mm. Memorial Day of 2022, we opened it up for tours. So we're taking guests up to the top All the way to, to the get top. a bird's eye view of the battlefield here. That's something I've never done, folks. And again... Yet another reason you got to come to Hawaii and visit the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum yeah. because this is a monument worth seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. we talk in the Battle of Midway about mm -hmm. the Devastator Torpedo Bomber yeah. and its inadequacy. Mm -hmm. It was eventually replaced by the Avenger, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is uh, also a torpedo bomber? Yep. yep. Okay, you want to talk to us about the Yeah, time? so uh, the TBM Avenger was a torpedo bomber. Uh, for the U.S. Navy and Marines flew them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is the largest and heaviest uh, single-engine propeller aircraft of World War II. Okay. Also. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. And, of course, mm -hmm. famously, we talked about a, bit, a minute ago about George H.W. Yeah. Bush mm -hmm. being shot down. And we showed his um, training aircraft. Yep. But this was the type of airplane he was yes. flying when he was shot down and and were there two or three crewmen on this aircraft? Uh, there were three crew on this aircraft, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Different than the uh, dive bombers, yeah. right? So dive, the dive bombers had uh, just two tail mm -hmm. gunner. What did the third crewman do? Uh, so you had the pilot, you had a tail gunner, and then radio operator and stinger gunner down below. He had another small machine gun down below. So he was, he was inside yep. the belly yep. of the airplane. That must yep. not have been a fun place to be. Probably not, no. <laughs> yeah. And in, both, in that case, uh, the case of... George H. W. Bush, mm -hmm. both of those crewmen yeah. died, right? Yeah. When he was mm -hmm. shot down. Yeah. Battle of Chichijima. That is an incredible, amazing, and very large propeller driven airplane. So mm -hmm. it's great yeah. that you have it here. Yeah. So Eric, you said that the Zero was in flyable condition. Mm -hmm. My guess is that this B seventeen is not in flyable condition. Not not quite there. No. no. <laughs> yeah. So talk to us about this. <laughs> yeah, so this aircraft right here is our B seventeen flying fortress. It's an E model of it. Mm -hmm. Um and it's it's a pretty special B seventeen. Mm -hmm. Um it was completed on the Boeing factory lines on November twenty eighth of nineteen forty one. Then it was sent to California for engine testing and was delivered to the U.S. Army on the late afternoon of December 6th of 1941. Wow. So this is one of the last pre-war aircraft delivered to the United States before the attack here that next morning. Now, famously, a squadron of B-17s mm -hmm. was supposed to fly yep. to Pearl Harbor, and December 7th, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about the story of yeah. a radar operator who saw mm -hmm. incoming airplanes. Yep. 
and he was told, don't worry about it. Yeah. Right, because it thought yeah. that it might be that squadron B-17s. Mm -hmm. This was not one of those. Airplanes. This was so, not. No, okay. that that squadron left before this one was accepted. Was, was yep. accepted. Yep. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, how did you come to uh, have it, and why is it in such bad condition? Well, uh, it arrived here at Hickam Field on December seventeenth, ten days after the attack, oh, on see. its way to uh, an air depot in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, it arrived here on December seventeenth. Stayed here for about a month and a half, getting the crew trained up, ready to go doing anti-submarine patrols throughout the islands, things like that. Uh, arrived in Australia on February 20th in 1942. Stayed there for two days when it left on its first and only combat mission of the war uh, on the evening of February 22nd. Uh, they were bombing shipping out of, uh, I think it was Port, Port Simpson out of Rabal. Rabal I believe that's yeah. what it, the mm -hmm. port was called. They were bombing shipping out of there, out of Rabal. Um, flew over the target, uh, dropped its bombs, was heading out of the area. It was the last one of the, the formation to show up over target, and enemy aircraft were up in the skies. And it got into a little aerial fight with some Zeros as mm. well. Uh, was able to outrun them. Uh, when a B-17 is unloaded, it's fairly fast. Wow. Um, so it was able to get away from them. They burnt off a little too much fuel, though, uh, and they were going to try and make it to the emergency landing field in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when they got to the island of New Guinea, they found out they were too low on fuel and wouldn't be able to climb over the mountains they had to get over. So they circled around, looked for a nice field to set it down in, uh, brought it down, basically a textbook gear up, belly landing. Uh, but they found out they were in a, about a four-foot deep swamp at that time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the aircraft had nine crew members on board at the time. Uh, all nine survived that landing uh, and spent the next several weeks cutting themselves out of the jungles and then going from village to village until they wound up in the hands of the Australian Army. Right, yep. out of Port Moresby. Yep. So the airplane stayed in PNG yep. until the end of the war and was recovered? Yeah, it stayed there, uh, went into the swamps on the early morning of February 23rd of 42, and it stayed in that spot in the swamps until the summer of 2006. 2006. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> when a crew eventually got to it and uh, basically cut it into the pieces that we see it in today uh -huh. uh, to airlift it out of the swamps by helicopter. Wow. Uh, and then it stayed there in Papua New Guinea until about 2010, there was some controversy about bringing it out of the country into the United States and back. Uh, mm. Some people wanted it to stay there on they site. Museums there some too, wanted you know? to bring it back to the U.S. Mm. Uh, eventually, in 2010, it made its way to California, mm. and in spring of 2013, made its way here. Okay. Yep. So, is there any plans to restore it, or is it going to kind of um, stay this way? From what I understand, it's uh, more of a preservation project than a restoration. I see. Uh, from what we know, it's. Uh, the only one with its extensive combat damage still remaining on it, okay. uh, on display. Uh, and having it down like this on its belly, it gives a different perspective to the B-17 as well. You don't normally see them down like this. That's you true. normally see them up on the gear. You can see the, yeah. the props are still bent yep. from the yep. landing. And, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm surprised there's not more aluminum corrosion damage yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, uh, I can imagine why the windows were burst out yeah. and things like that. The bombardier mm -hmm. station here. Um, yeah. That took a beating oh, on yeah. that landing, oh, no yeah. doubt. But it's a great, great artifact of mm -hmm. that battle. Oh, yeah. Definitely. We talk a lot about Rabal, and here's yeah. a, uh, an airplane that actually flew combat missions mm -hmm. over Rabal. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So we mentioned when we were talking about the, the control tower, mm -hmm. that it's been renovated. And I mentioned that the Navy kept trying to use appropriated yeah. funds to restore mm -hmm. it and the historical funds. And, and that kicked kept getting pushed out of the budget. Yeah. So how did that finally get funded? So uh, the museum here got uh, access to the building to start working on it. Mm. And uh, the Navy did help a, with a little bit of the funding of it, I believe. Mm. Uh, but most of the funding for the restoration project of the tower and most of our aircraft here comes through donations to the museum. Donations. Yep. So it's people like you, folks. Mm -hmm. Seth and I do this as a labor of love. We don't make money. We spend a lot of money to make this thing happen. Uh, we're never going to make a penny on it. The, the thing you've got to keep in mind is there's no way museums like this or the, the Submarine Museum of the Pacific, the Bowfin, mm -hmm. or the National World War II Museum or any of these other great museums, Seth's Museum at Camp mm -hmm. Shelby, any of these museums could work without your donations. That's what keeps this stuff from falling apart and then being rendered, you know, kind of useless, lost to history. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that everybody do what they can to help support. Don't just 
believe that World War II history should be learned and kept alive, but do something about it and find a museum that, that helps with this kind mm -hmm. of stuff and, and do your part, do whatever you can to help them do what oh, they're yeah. doing because mm -hmm. it's great work you're oh, doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you're you. Right. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot out of this. These are important historic sites that should not be lost to our public consciousness. They're as important to America's and, and really our allies' involvement in World War II as anything we could possibly imagine. So that's it for this week's episode of The Unauthorized History of the Pacific War. I'm Captain Toady, and for Seth Parrott and my partner in crime this week, we're out. <laughs>